In this four-part series entitled The Enemies We Face, Derek Prince identifies witchcraft with its many forms and manifestations as the universal religion of fallen man. He explores this theme and gives practical strategy for achieving victory over these enemies. Now, The Enemies We Face, Part 1, The Structure of Satan's Kingdom. This is the first of four successive talks on the theme of the enemies we face. I trust that all of us who are committed to Jesus here this evening do realize that we face enemies because it's a very dangerous situation to have powerful and active enemies working against you and not even be aware that you have those enemies. The enemies that we face are not persons of flesh and blood, but they are invisible spirit beings. The themes that we're going to deal with in these talks concern things which are not discerned by human senses. The Bible speaks about things which eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man. Things that are invisible and spiritual. The things we're going to talk about can only be understood through the scriptures. There is no other source of reliable information. A lot of people imagine, I think, that the things we see, and touch, and hear, and taste are the truly real things. Actually, all through the ages, philosophers have come to the conclusion that they're not truly real. They're temporary, they're impermanent, and they're very often deceptive. You cannot rely on your senses. It's amazing how many different philosophers down the ages have come to that conclusion. The Bible says the same. Paul says, the things which are seen are temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. In other words, the things of the sense world are only temporary. They're only partly real. They do not endure. But the things of the spiritual world that we cannot see, that we cannot perceive with our senses, are the truly real things. They are the things that endure. So when we come to a theme like this, we have to begin by making a mental adjustment and saying to ourselves, I'm not going to limit myself to the things that I can see and touch and hear and taste, but I'm going to open my heart and mind to the revelation that's given me in Scripture through the Holy Spirit to things that are of a different world. Paul prayed for the Ephesian Christians that God would give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. And I pray that for us here, that God may grant us, as we open our hearts to His Word, a spirit of wisdom and revelation, because we're dealing with things that can only be known by revelation. What we're going to deal with, in essence, is two kingdoms, two opposing kingdoms that are at war with one another. But they're not natural kingdoms such as Britain and Sweden or other nations, but they are invisible spiritual kingdoms. One is the kingdom of God and the other is the kingdom of Satan. I'd like to begin by reading from Matthew chapter 12, just two verses, 26 and 28. Jesus had been accused by the Pharisees that he was able to drive out demons because he was in league with the prince of the demons, who was called Beelzebub. And he pointed out to them that was a very illogical explanation and it couldn't possibly be true. In pointing it out to them, he said these two things. First of all, in verse 26, if Satan casts out Satan, 
he is divided against himself, how then will his kingdom stand? So Satan has a kingdom, as Jesus himself has indicated. A, a lot of Christians, I think, find it difficult to understand that. But here it is, clearly stated. And then, two verses further on, Jesus says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. There's the other kingdom, the kingdom of God. So here are two invisible spiritual kingdoms. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of Satan. And Jesus points out that there is one particular aspect of his ministry that brings the two kingdoms out into the open, and that is the driving out of demons by his power and authority. The demons, invisible spirit beings, represent the kingdom of Satan. Jesus and then those who are his servants and follow his ministry represent the kingdom of God. And in the driving out of demons, the visible clash of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan is brought out into, into the open. Also, the fact that Jesus and his servants can drive out the demons of Satan is convincing evidence that the kingdom of God is more powerful than the kingdom of Satan. Personally, I believe that's why Satan particularly dislikes and opposes the ministry of deliverance because it brings out into the open things which he would rather keep secret and it also demonstrates that the kingdom of Jesus is more powerful than his kingdom. Now I want to speak in this talk about the nature and the structure of Satan's kingdom and we'll turn to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 which is I think the main verse that brings this out. And again, I want to remind you, <clears throat> we are now talking about things you cannot perceive with your senses. I'll read, what I'm reading is the New King James, which is like the Old King James, but a bit modernized. Ephesians 6, 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The word places is inverted commas. It's put in by the translation, translators. I think it's better to say in the heavenlies. Somebody commented once that most of the church has punctuated that verse wrong. The way they read it is like this. For we do not wrestle, full stop. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. <laughs> uh, I want to give you the Prince version <clears throat> of this particular verse. I studied Greek since I was 10 years old. I'm qualified to teach it at university level. I don't say that to boast, but at least it gives me a right to my opinion. I may not, <laughs> I may not be right, but I'm entitled to an opinion. Um, I'd like to begin by taking a phrase from the Living Bible, which says, our wrestling match is not against persons with bodies. I think that's very vivid. It's extremely important to understand that we're dealing with persons. Until we grasp that, we're really like a blindfolded boxer. We are dealing with persons, but they are persons without bodies, spirit beings. Now we'll go on for our wrestling match. Again, I want to point out that this is a very intense conflict. I think of all the forms of interpersonal conflict, wrestling is the most intense. It's one person totally pitted against another person. And it's no accident that Paul uses that phrase for our warfare against Satan's kingdom. It is total warfare. Our wrestling match is not against persons with bodies. Now here comes the Prince version but against rulerships with various areas and descending orders of authority, against the world dominators of this present darkness, against spiritual hosts of wickedness 
in the heavenlies. What I want to point out to you is that Satan's kingdom is no jumble. It's a highly organized kingdom for which he gets no credit because he was, I believe, and we'll deal with this in a few moments, one of the chief angels in charge of a large section of the angels. And as such, he had a divinely given organizational system. And when he rebelled against God and led his angels in rebellion, they simply took the system with them, but turned it against God. So don't imagine that Satan doesn't have a highly organized kingdom, for which, as I say, he gets no credit. The credit goes to God. But let's take into account the fact that he is no simpleton. He's a very astute, powerful, and evil being. Let's now go briefly through the, the revised version or the, or the amplified version that I gave you. He's, we're against rulerships. I say rulerships because the Greek word is abstract. It's not rulers, although most of the modern translations say that. It's rulerships. There's a certain level of a spiritual authority in Satan's kingdom, which is the level of rulerships. And under these rulers are sub-rulers with various areas of authority. And under them are sub-sub-rulers with smaller areas of authority. So one ruler has a major area of authority. Under him are lesser rulers, each of whom has a small area, part of that. Under them are sub, lesser, lesser rulers that have smaller areas of authority. All right, that's the first uh, picture. And in a little while, by turning to the Old Testament, I'll give you some very clear examples of how it functions. Then it says, against the world dominators of this present darkness. I deliberately chose to use the word dominate because it's a satanic word. God never dominates. Where you encounter domination, somewhere behind it is Satan. And Satan's ambition, desire, and strategy is to come to the place where he dominates this entire world but he will dominate it with a system of darkness. You see, God's kingdom is a kingdom of light. Satan's kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. Those who are in God's kingdom know whom they are serving, and they see pretty clearly what they are doing. Those who are in Satan's kingdom, most of them do not even know whom they are serving, nor do they know what they are actually doing. And then the third phrase, it's against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenlies. Whole armies of wicked, powerful, rebellious spirit beings in a realm which is called the heavenlies. It's been a sort of accepted tradition in the church that Satan is in hell. Most people think of that way. My comment on that is it would be nice if it were true, but it isn't. <laughs> and there's no warranty whatever in the scripture for assuming that. Now we'll come back to that in just a few moments, but let's consider briefly how this satanic kingdom came into being. I want to turn to Isaiah chapter 14 and read a few verses there. These verses deal with a being called Lucifer. Um, the word Lucifer, which is from a Latin root, means the one who brings light, the shining being. The Hebrew is Ayelet HaShachar, which is the morning star. At any rate, whichever form of name you use, it means a very bright, shining, glorious person. And I believe myself he was what's called an archangel. Now, the word ark, again from a Greek root, don't worry about all that, means ruling. 
So an archangel is a ruling angel, an angel who rules others. The same word occurs in archbishop. An archbishop is a bishop who rules other bishops. And here we have, I believe, a picture of one of the main archangels in God's heavenly hosts. His name was Lucifer. He was called that because he was so glorious and so beautiful. But he made a sad error. He turned in rebellion against his creator and sought to make himself equal with God. Very interesting, we have a comparison between Lucifer on the one hand and Jesus on the other. Lucifer was a created being not equal with God. He sought equality with God and fell. Concerning Jesus, it says in Philippians chapter 2, he did not think equality with God something to be grasped at. He had it by divine right. But he humbled himself and God exalted him. Now let's look at this little picture here. Beginning in verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, morning star? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? Now we get the motivation of Lucifer's rebellion. <coughs> and in the following verses, we get the phrase, I will, five times. It's the will of the creature set against the will of, the will of God. The, the, the key word is rebellion. For you have said in your heart, and remember that God knows what we say in our heart. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I'm going up. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit in the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend. You notice the whole thing is going up. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. The Most High is Almighty God. And the word means also, I will be equal to God. So Satan's ambition was to elevate himself to a position of equality with God. And he, he was motivated because he was so wise and so beautiful and so glorious that he said to himself, well, I could be God. My personal opinion, and this is just an opinion, is that he motivated the angels who were under his charge to join him in rebellion. And I just picture this, if you can imagine this kind of thing going on in heaven. And all this started in heaven, believe it or not, but it did. I can imagine him going around to the angels that were under his charge and saying, now you really have talent. You're unusually gifted. God doesn't really appreciate all that you have. But if I were in charge, you see, I'd give you the position that you really deserve. Uh, and uh, apparently, again, this is not necessarily, it's a matter of inference, he undermined the loyalty of one-third of the angels to God and drew them with him in his rebellion and in his fall. And so God says, You shall be cast down to the sides of the pit. Let us look also in Ezekiel chapter 28 where we get another picture of this same remarkable being. Ezekiel chapter 28 has got two sections. The, each of them is a lamentation or a pronouncement of woe. The first is on the prince of Tyre. The second is on the king of Tyre. Now, if you study the chapter in detail, which we do not have time to do, you find that the prince of Tyre was a human being. It's very clearly stated he was a man, even though he claimed to be God. On the other hand, it's very obvious as we read the description of the king of Tyre that he was no human being. And we have here a little interesting picture of how Satan's kingdom operates. We have the human ruler, the prince of Tyre, but behind him in the unseen realm, we have the satanic ruler, the king of Tyre. And in a sense, the human ruler is really not much more than a puppet who moves as 
the strings from the unseen realm dictate his moves. When you begin to see these truths, history and politics take on a very different meaning. I think many, many of the great, so-called great men of history were simply satanic puppets who were moved by invisible strings from the kingdom of Satan to do the things they did. Anyhow, let's look at a little of what uh, the Word of God says to this second being, beginning in Ezekiel 28, verse 12. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold a totally glorious, resplendent being. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Also, a master musician. Now, there are quite a lot of Bible teachers who believe that Satan, uh, let's say Lucifer, he hadn't changed his name then, Lucifer was responsible for orchestrating the worship of heaven. I think it's important to know that Satan, as he is today, knows a lot about music and he know, uses music as one of his means to captivate people. Going on in verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. Who covers what? The throne of God. See the scripture makes it plain that there is a cherub or there are cherubs who with their outstretched wings cover the very throne of God. What a position of honor, glory. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. This is no human being. You can see that. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. And God reminds him, you were created. You're not God. You're a created being. You were perfect in, the way in, in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. I prefer to use the word rebellion. <clears throat> till you became a rebel. <clears throat> and then we read in verse 16, by the abundance of your trading. Now, the same word in the book of Proverbs is used of a talebearer. It's used of a trader because a trader goes to and fro presenting his wares and selling them. But it's used of a talebearer because a talebearer goes to and fro telling tales. Now that's why my thought is that Satan went around just telling his angels, well look, you see, if, if, if I had that position, you'd really be appreciated. I mean, I would promote you. You would get the, the authority that you really deserve. So that's just my opinion. But let's say by the abundance of your manipulations, your scheming, your plotting, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Notice the therefore. What does the therefore indicate? God's judgment on rebellion. And then we get the real motivation of Satan of Lucifer. Let's call him Lucifer till he becomes Satan. Verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. What was the initial motivation of Satan? What was the first sin? Pride, that's right. We need to remember that always. The first sin in the universe took place in heaven not on earth. It wasn't drunkenness. It wasn't adultery. It wasn't even lying. It was pride. And believe me, it's still far the most deadly and dangerous of all sins. And lots of churchgoers who wouldn't commit adultery or get drunk are very easily enticed into pride and don't even realize how dangerous it is. 
Now, I want to deal with a question that comes up in many people's minds. They say, well, if Satan was cast out of heaven, how can it be that he's still in the heavenlies? The answer is very simple. There's more than one heaven. The heavenlies are plural. In the first verse of the Bible, heaven is presented as plural. In the beginning, God created the heavens plural, the earth singular. And if you trace it all through the Bible, heaven is presented as plural. We'll just look at two scriptures, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. Paul is talking about people who've had remarkable experiences in the supernatural realm. And he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Now, before I became a preacher, I was a logician. Somebody once misheard me say I was a magician, but that's not so. <laughs> And uh, logic has still stuck with me. And my logical mind tells me if there's a third heaven, there has to be a first and a second. You cannot have the third of anything without the first two. So if there is a third heaven, as Paul indicates, then there are at least three heavens. Heaven is plural. One other scripture just to confirm that in Ephesians chapter 4, Verses 9 and 10, speaking about what happened between the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection and ascension. It says, now this, he, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? This is talking about Jesus. He also who descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. You notice the phrase, all the heavens. Again, it is not correct to use the word all of less than three of anything. That's the minimum. When I was, years ago, when I was principal of a college for training African teachers in Kenya, one of my, my, one of my students came to me and said, all my parents have come to see me. So I said, I understand what you mean, but you can't say that because in English you cannot use all if there are only two. It has to be at least three. And so when Paul says, Jesus ascended far above all heavens, again, the minimum that will qualify is three. Personally, I think that's the, that's the total. That's my personal opinion. You do hear people say sometimes, not so often these days, I was in the seventh heaven. Uh, I would suggest you probably better not use that. I understand the phrase comes from the Quran, the Islamic book, and I don't think there's any biblical authority for more than three heavens. So if you're feeling really happy, it's all right to say I was on cloud nine <laughs> because the Bible indicates there's a lot of clouds. Uh, now I'll offer you an opinion. This is simply something that seems probable to me. You don't have to believe it. You can go to heaven without agreeing with me. <laughs> but uh, you may get there sooner than I do. <laughs> uh, I believe the third heaven into which this man that Paul knew was caught up is the heaven of God's presence, God's dwelling. And there it says he heard unspeakable words, the very words of God himself. Now, I, I'm inclined to believe the first heaven is the visible heaven that we see. So the second must be between the first and the third, somewhere between our planet and the heaven of God's dwelling, there is another heaven. This is, again, my opinion. I think there are a lot of things in the Bible that confirm it and in our experience. So, between us and God is a satanic kingdom. I think this has got a lot to do with things that happen in our lives. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, praying through. Praying through what? I know when I first sought the Lord as a 
person who didn't know him. I tried to pray for an hour and couldn't utter a word. Yet I was earnestly seeking him. And then somehow I broke through. I believe, looking back, I broke through satanic forces that were opposing me coming into direct personal contact with Jesus. That was the turning point in my whole life. So don't laugh at the old-time Pentecostals who talk about praying through. Their, some of their methods may be a little bit unconventional, but the truth is there. This is part of our spiritual warfare. I'll give you a few examples in just a few minutes. But I think if you begin to realize that there is an opposing kingdom between you and God, it'll make a lot more sense in your spiritual experience. It'll teach you lessons in prayer. I want to turn now to the book of Daniel, which contains a great deal of useful information in these areas. And I want to take an incident in the life of Daniel which I believe illustrates the principles that I'm trying to bring out. The, the chapter that I want to turn to is chapter 10. And if you are really interested in your own time, you need to study this chapter carefully. But to economize on time, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to just give a brief background. At a certain point when Daniel was a very mature believer, he gave himself to fasting for 21 days, three weeks, with what has become called a Daniel fast. He didn't abstain from all forms of food, but he ate only very simple, basic food, and he took no wine, no fancy drinks, as it says in the Living Bible, of course, no desserts. <laughs> and uh, he was earnestly seeking God for, the, for an understanding of the future destiny of his people, the Jewish people. And for three weeks he prayed and nothing happened. See, this is an illustration of what I'm talking about. And then a marvelous, mighty, heavenly being came with the answer to his prayer. So powerful was the presence of this being that the other people with Daniel simply fled in terror. And Daniel was left absolutely bereft of physical strength, just almost like John later when he saw Jesus after the resurrection and ascension. He said, I fell at his feet like one dead. But this angel had come with the answer to Daniel's prayer. He had been sent from God. The point that I want to emphasize is the first day Daniel started to pray, the angel was sent. But he didn't arrive till three weeks later because on the way from God's throne to Daniel's presence on earth, he encountered satanic opposition. The opposition he encountered was not from human beings. No human being could withstand an angel like that. It was not on earth, it was not in God's heaven, but it was in some area between the heaven of God and earth. I believe the area of Satan's kingdom. In other words, the angel had to break through Satan's kingdom to arrive with the message that God had sent him with. And this is what he says. And he's going to be talking about certain beings, one called the Prince of Persia, others called the kings of Persia, and later the prince of Greece. And as you look at these, you'll find that none of them are human beings. They are all angelic beings, satanic angels, who did their best to oppose the coming of the angel to Daniel. Let me point out something that I think is thrilling. Daniel's prayer set all heaven in motion. It set the angel of God on his way and it stirred up the angels of Satan to oppose. And Daniel had to pray through. He had to hold on for 21 days before he got the answer. So dear brothers and sisters, sometimes when you're praying and you don't get an answer, it's not because you're praying for the wrong thing. 
In fact, it's because you're praying for the right thing. But there's opposition. And one of the things that we'll be seeking to look at in these talks is how to overcome the opposition. How to pray through, how to break through, how to win the victory over these forces. Anyhow, let's look at what the angel said to Daniel in verses 12 and 13. That's Daniel 10, verses 12 and 13. Then he, the angel, said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, how did he humble himself? By fasting. Bear that in mind. Fasting is an appointed way to humble ourselves before God. From the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I've come because of your words. In other words, God sent me the first day you started to pray. Why didn't he arrive? Not because the journey from God's throne to heaven takes an angel 21 days. That's not the reason. Now verse 13, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me, resisted me 21 days. Who is the prince of the kingdom of Persia? Probably Satan, but at any rate, it's the satanic angel whom Satan has set over the Persian Empire to work out God's purposes, I mean, to work out Satan's purposes, resist God's purposes in the Persian Empire. Now let me pause for a moment. Why was the Persian Empire important at this time? Well, if you study the history of Israel, there were four successive Gentile empires that dominated the Jewish people after they had turned against God in rebellion and been exiled from their own land. The first was Babylon, which took them into exile. The second was Medo-Persia, or Persia, which was the one that was in power in Daniel's time. The third was Greece. The fourth was Rome. And all God's purposes for the human race centered in the Jewish people because only from the Jewish people could come the Messiah and the Savior. And because God's purpose is centered in Israel, Satan's opposition likewise centered in Israel. In other words, when you're in the center of God's plan, that's when you'll have the most satanic opposition. It's, it's important to bear that in mind. So, what Satan was seeking to do was keep the Jewish people, Israel, under bondage and away from the returning to their own land. What Daniel was praying for was the return of Israel to their own land. So this satanic prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood him. And then the angel goes on, and Michael, one of the chief princes, or one of the archangels, came to help me. So this angel couldn't break through on his own. This is really a fascinating picture. And uh, why did Michael come? What is Michael's particular job amongst the archangels? He has one very important assignment. Keep your finger in Daniel 10. Turn for a moment to Daniel 12 verse 1. Daniel 12 verse 1. At that time Michael shall stand up the great prince, that's the archangel, who stands watch over the sons of your people. Who are the sons of your people when Daniel is being addressed? The Jewish people, that's right. So any time uh, Michael is in the center, you can be sure the Jewish people are center stage in history. Because his particular task is to watch over them, protect them from Satan's attempts to destroy them, which have been, as we all know, very numerous. Going back to Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13, uh, the, the angel concludes with, I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now, kings is plural. And I think, contrary to our usual usage, the prince was the supreme ruler, the kings were under him. So there was one prince, and under him, a number of kings. That's what I said. 
rulers with various areas and descending orders of authority. What were the jobs of those kings? We have no word from God, but I personally believe that, for instance, if, let's take Great Britain, Satan has a prince over Great Britain, which I don't doubt he has. By no means do I doubt that. Under that major prince, there are lesser rulers who probably dominate each of the main cities of Britain. As a preacher going around, I've learned by experience to put out my antennae when I come to a city and try to discern what is the particular satanic power over that particular city. Then in the Persian kingdom, there were many different ethnic groups. And I'm inclined to believe that there is a satanic power over each major ethnic group. If I can say this without offending anybody, I think that's particularly obvious in the case of the American Indians, which is a very tragic story. Because in all the spiritual and material blessings that have come to America, the American Indians have hardly tasted any of them. And they are extremely deep in witchcraft. And I personally believe that that particular satanic person to whom was assigned the task of keeping the American Indians in darkness and bondage has prevailed basically up to this time. We could go with many other ethnic groups, but time doesn't allow us. Then, of course, there were also in the Persian Empire a lot of different religions. And I'm inclined to believe each religious group or cult or sect had a particular ruler over it. So here was God's angel being resisted by a whole group of satanic angels opposing his coming to Daniel. However, when Michael came, he broke through, delivered his message, but he said to Daniel, I want to tell you what's going to happen when I go back. So we go on now to verse 20 of Daniel chapter 10. <clears throat> then the angel said, Do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to fight with the Prince of Persia. In other words, uh, the, the, the battle with the Prince of Persia isn't finished. What would happen to the Persian Empire when the Prince of Persia had been dealt with? In all probability, it would collapse, which it did a little later. But it wasn't the last empire. And so he says, And when I have gone forth, indeed the Prince of Greece will come the satanic ruler over the next major empire. Under Alexander the Great, the Greek empire totally crushed and defeated the Persian empire and assumed dominion over a tremendous area of the earth's service. Alexander, in ten years, conquered from Greece in the west to India in the east, including also the area, the south coast of the Mediterranean, one of the most tremendous feats of military conquest. But there was another person. There was a prince behind him. I'm really inclined to believe that most of the major events of human history can only be fully explained in those terms. And then he says, the angel in verse 21, but I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. In other words, I really came to tell you what the word of God says. And you find the next chapters contain that. And he says, no one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. And then he goes on in the first verse of the next chapter, which is part of the same talk. Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. Now Darius was the first Medo-Persian ruler that crushed the Babylonian empire and moved in and took its place. And Darius and Cyrus after him opened the way for the Jewish people to begin to return to their own land. So in a certain sense, the defeat of Babylon by, Dar by Darius was a major spiritual victory in the purposes of God. And this angel says, I was the one that strengthened Darius. Again, we see that human rulers and human commanders don't operate in a vacuum on their own 
Behind them are unseen angelic forces, both divine and satanic. The angels of God strengthen those rulers and men who will forward the purposes of God on earth. The angels of Satan resist those men. That's a very major reason why Christians should pray for the rulers of their nations. If it's possible, they should inhibit the activity of satanic angels and release the activity of God's angels. But remember, this particular situation, nothing happened until Daniel prayed. I don't know of anything that challenges us more to prayer than this revelation. And it seems to me, although this may seem strange, that Daniel's prayer was one of the forces that enabled the angel of God to break through. So, brothers and sisters, maybe you've been underestimating the possibility of what your prayers can do. Now, so Satan, fallen from being Lucifer, having set up his rival rebellious kingdom in the heavenlies, rules there over a host of rebellious angels. The key word to describe Satan and those who are with him is the word rebel. Rebellion against God. Now, Satan also has a lower, shall we say, stratum of his kingdom on earth. And again, the key word that describes those over whom he rules on earth is the word rebel. This is made plain in Ephesians chapter 2. We're talking now not about Satan's kingdom in the heavenlies, but those over whom he rules on earth. Ephesians chapter 2, and these words are addressed to Christians. And you, God made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now he describes how people live before they are converted and become to serve God in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who is the prince of the power of the air? Satan, that's right. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. What's the word that describes the sons of disobedience? Rebels, that's right. Anyone who is in rebellion against God automatically comes under the control of Satan. Understand? It's not enough to go to church and sing hymns. You have to lay down your rebellion against God and submit yourself to Jesus. That's when the change comes. Lots of churchgoers are still rebels. And as rebels, they are actually being controlled by Satan. Now Paul goes on saying in verse 3, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. Any of us disagree here? One thing I know is I certainly did. I have no doubts about where I was before the Lord found me. I was a rebel and in the kingdom of rebels. I didn't know it. I thought I was very clever, very successful. I thought I had all the answers to everything until I started to read the Bible and then I discovered I didn't. I can't go into that, but I, I just want to say, Paul said we apostles, including I, Paul, we were all in that category. Rebels being manipulated by Satan through spiritual power, which we didn't understand. We didn't know who was pulling the strings. We just moved as their strings were pulled. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. No, notice it's not only the desires of the flesh, but our minds are alienated and at enmity with God until we surrender. The intellectuals are some of God's most fervent enemies. And then he says, we were by nature the children of wrath, just as others. So that's a description of the lower stratum of Satan's kingdom. Humanity on earth. All human rebels regardless of their race or their denominational label. Unless they are truly submitted to Jesus Christ, God's appointed ruler, 
are rebels and Satan by spiritual power controls them. Now there's a very interesting phrase there. It says he is the ruler of the power, the realm of authority of the air. I can't dwell on this, but there are two main Greek words for air. One is air, from which we get the word air. The other is aethia, from which we get the word ether. Now I'm not concerned with the words that come from them, but the, the fact is that air is the lower air, contiguous with the Earth's surface. Aethia is the higher, rarer air. Which word do you think is used here? The lower air. In other words, Satan rules the surface of the Earth. That's his realm. So a lot of interesting speculations, because when Jesus comes, it says we will be caught up to meet him in the air. Which air? The lower air. However, we can't go into all that. There's a lot we could theorize about that, but we'll restrain ourselves. Just want to give you one remarkable picture of Satan, which you may have never have noticed. In the book of Job, chapter 41. Now, the whole of this chapter deals with a creature named Leviathan, who is some kind of marine monster. And we don't know very much about Leviathan, but do you think that the Bible, which is so economical, would devote 34 verses just to a marine monster? No. The truth is Leviathan is a type or a picture of Satan. You can study this carefully and see this. I only want to point out to you the closing statement in Job 41:34. He beholds every high thing, he's extremely proud, and he is king over all the children of pride. That's Satan. Wherever pride enters the human heart, well, that's the influence that caused Satan to rebel against God. Pride brings us under the control of Satan. Doesn't matter whether we're Pentecostals, Baptists, Catholics, that's not the issue. The issue is, what's our heart attitude toward God? And unless we have a heart that is truly submitted and surrendered to God through Jesus Christ, we can use all sorts of nice religious language and lay claim to all sorts of titles. But the fact is, we are under the King Leviathan because he's king over all the children of pride. How many sermons do you hear against pride? You don't need to answer me. You see, basically, I think the church today is majoring on minors. I know when I was a pastor years ago, I used to be right down on people smoking. That was terrible. The problem was, we wouldn't have people in our congregation at that time that smoked. But we didn't say anything about people that quarrel with their wives. And I felt such a hypocrite when I told the young man that he couldn't be a member because he smoked. And I knew there were people in the congregation that were very wrong in their attitude and relationship to their wives or to their husbands. See, things like smoking and drinking and drunkenness are just little branches on the tree. But you know what the root is? Rebellion. And the Gospel of Matthew in introducing the gospel causes John the Baptist to say, now also the axe is laid to what? The root of the tree. That's right. That's what we should be aiming at. All right, now, I want to give you just a little closing summation of Satan's ambitions, his purposes. He has very definite purposes. He has two main ambitions to dominate the whole human race. And you remember that one of the phrases used in Ephesians 6.12 was the world dominators of this present darkness. And his second purpose is to receive worship. You need to understand this. You see, he laid claim to equality of God, with God, but was disqualified. But he hasn't given up the claim. And there's one way he can still assert the claim. What is that? by receiving worship. 
because worship is due only to God. So whenever Satan receives worship, he's saying, there you are, you see, I'm still God. And when you really analyze everything that Satan does, his ultimate purpose is to receive the worship of the whole human race. And in my judgment, from a prophetic perspective, he's very near to achieving his ambition. <coughs> Satan and his angels in the heavenlies were, I believe, the gods of paganism. All gods recognized and worshipped by all pagan societies and races are just different ways of describing Satan and his angels. Zeus, Hermes, Poseidon, all the Greek gods that I used to know so much about and care so little about now, just different labels for satanic angels. And as you look through all the cultures of human race, you see different titles, but the same beings. And when they worship, what are they worshipping? Satan and his angels. And there's one particular way that fallen man has to relate to the satanic kingdom. The generic word is witchcraft, which is prevalent in all pagan societies under different forms. You hardly go to any major section of the human race which still has some kind of pagan background without encountering a person who's called the witch doctor. You find a different name in different languages, but the same person. The witch doctor, in a certain sense, is Satan's priest. He's the one who enables people to get in touch with Satan's kingdom. Why do they want that? Two main reasons. First of all, they're terribly afraid of the disasters that Satan would bring upon them. And most of their sacrifices and their rites are to propitiate these very cruel and temperamental beings. And secondly, they want power. And witchcraft is a means to power. I tell people in foreign mission fields, don't ever go to Africa or India and tell people that Satan isn't real, because they all know he is. Demons are real, they know them well. What you have to tell them is, demons are real, but Jesus is real, and he has defeated the demons. And he gives us power to defeat them. So ultimately, witchcraft, as a religious practice, is an expression of man's rebellion against God. Witchcraft is the natural religion of fallen man, and it permeates the whole human race. It's not something very strange or unusual. And the last thing I want to say, and it's important, is in our days, witchcraft is making a determined comeback. It's like where Christianity came. These satanic beings were forced back, but they were never totally defeated. And now they're saying, it's our turn, we're coming back. If you would like information about further teaching resources available from Derek Prince Ministries UK, please call us and request a copy of our latest resource guide on 01462 492 100. You may also visit our website at www.dpmuk.org or write to us at dpmuk Kingsfield. Hadrian Way, Bulldog, SG7 6AM. In this four part series entitled The Enemies We Face, Derek Prince identifies witchcraft with its many forms and manifestations as the universal religion of fallen man. He explores this theme and gives practical strategy for achieving victory over these enemies. Now, The Enemies We Face, Part 2, The Nature of Witchcraft. This is the second talk in our series on the enemies we face. In our previous talk, we looked at the nature and the structure of Satan's kingdom, and we saw that his kingdom operates on two levels. 
The upper level is in the heavenlies, somewhere in the heavenly region that is not the heaven of God and is not the visible heaven. And his upper, re upper level consists of rebellious angels who are in opposition to God. And then the lower level consists of men who are not surrendered to God and to the righteous government of Jesus, the Messiah and the Savior. And I pointed out that the key word that describes all those in Satan's kingdom is the word rebel. They are all in rebellion against God, whether they are angels or whether they are men. And then we saw that the gods of the pagan world whether they're Greece or Rome or whatever other nation, are different ways of naming and depicting Satan's kingdom of angels. And all the, those who have been worshipped by pagan religions and pagan societies are satanic angels. The particular generic name for the way that men seek to contact these satanic angels is witchcraft. You could say that witchcraft is the religion of fallen humanity. It's got countless different forms and ceremonies but it has this one common feature that it's different ways of contacting different satanic spiritual beings. There are many different ceremonies. Most of them are in some way sensual or cruel or defiling. The things that men have done through the ages to somehow ingratiate themselves with Satan and his kingdom have been really terrible to contemplate. I spoke a little bit about the American Indians as an example of a, of, a, of a racial group that have for the most part not escaped from the dominion of Satan. And just as a matter of interest, I was reading in the National Geographical magazine, their main ceremony is what they call the sun dance, in which they fasten hooks in their skin and then hang by those hooks and tear great portions of their skin out. They do this in order to worship their God. There are countless other different forms of such worship all over the earth. As I said, go to any kind of society that still retains the marks of its primitive nature and there's one kind of person that you'll find everywhere with a different name in each language, but it is witch doctor. And in many of those societies, really the most powerful person is the witch doctor. We have a remarkable example even in the Bible. Uh, it says that Philip went down to Samaria and preached in a city of Samaria, but there was a man there who dominated the whole of the, that city. His name was Simon. He was a sorcerer, that is, a practitioner of witchcraft. And it says the whole city was in fear of him because of the magic that he used. That's not an un unusual situation. In a certain sense, that's a pretty typical picture of pagan primitive society. So there is a direct connection between rebellion and witchcraft. When I say rebellion, I mean rebellion against God. This is brought out very clearly in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 23. These are words that were spoken by the prophet Samuel to King Saul after Saul himself had become a rebel. He had refused to obey the particular charge and commission that had been given him by God through the prophet Samuel. And here Samuel is telling Saul 
God's estimate of his conduct. And he says, we could read verse 22, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. And now he goes on with this definition of witchcraft. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Samuel makes two comparisons there. Rebellion is a twin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is a twin of idolatry. I'm not going to comment on idolatry at any length, but let me point out one way in which a stubborn person is an idolater. A stubborn person makes idols of his own opinions. And that's a form of idolatry. You see, it's interesting to consider our attitude in the church today. We won't accept, as a most part, drunkards or openly immoral people. But how many stubborn people do we have in church. And in God's eyes, they're idolaters. We wouldn't have somebody who came into the kind of churches we're used to with a, a wooden idol, fall down and worship in front of the church. We'd say we don't tolerate that. But alas, I'm afraid we tolerate a lot of stubborn people. And often we let them get away with it. But let's return to the other comparison. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Very, very important. The root of witchcraft is rebellion. And wherever you find rebellion, you can anticipate witchcraft. I learned this in the ministry of deliverance. For instance, I learned that if a person needed deliverance from a spirit of witchcraft, almost invariably, they also need a deliverance from rebellion. And conversely, where you encounter a spirit of rebellion, you better check to see that there isn't also a spirit of witchcraft. They're close together. Let me try and explain to you simply how this comes about. You see, rebellion rejects God's authority, legitimate authority, just like King Saul rejected the authority of God's word. But you can't exist in life for long without authority. So if you don't have legitimate authority, it's going to be replaced by illegitimate authority. And if you have illegitimate authority, it has to be supported by illegitimate power. And the illegitimate power that supports rebellion is the power of witchcraft. So really, wherever you find illegitimate authority being exercised, you better be prepared to deal with witchcraft. There was a very clear example in the United States in the 1960s. There was the rebellious generation. They turned their backs on almost all accepted forms of authority, parents, church, government, whatever. And they became a generation of rebels. Now I've dealt with many of them, and many of them that met the Lord are my friends today. But almost without one exception, all those who went in rebellion went into the occult, went into the satanic supernatural, went into witchcraft. This is the logic of spiritual experience. It is almost impossible to be deeply involved in rebellion without sooner or later coming under the power of witchcraft. If we go back to the example of King Saul for a moment, if you remember the story, he disobeyed Samuel's injunction to slaughter all the animals that had been captured and he kept, as he called it, the best to offer to God. God said, I'm not interested in your sacrifice because it comes out of disobedience. Now, Saul himself as king of Israel had actually put away all the witches from Israel. But just before his death, in desperation, when he couldn't hear from God, he himself sought to a witch. 
That's not an accident. That's cause and effect. I want to emphasize this. Wherever there is rebellion, sooner or later there will be witchcraft. And another point is this, that when you want to deal with witchcraft, the satanic, supernatural, the occult in all its forms, if you only deal with the occult, you've not dealt with the root. Because the root is rebellion. Now I want to give you a little picture of what witchcraft is like. This is something that God has given me what I think I could call a postgraduate course in. I didn't apply for it. I just got enrolled. Ruth and I got enrolled together. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you briefly how it happened. We were in a, in a conference in the, in the center of the United States in 1979, just about a year after we were married, less than a year. And it was a family conference. And the theme was essentially dealing with family relationships and so on. But in the middle, a young man stood up. I, mean, I don't think I've ever met him. I don't know who he was, but he gave a tremendously powerful prophecy, which was fortunately recorded on tape, so that I've seen the written version. And in this prophecy, God said that all that he had been doing against witchcraft up to that time was merely preliminary skirmishes. But from that point onwards, 1979, he was declaring total war on witchcraft. And he said, the reason is this, because witchcraft has millions of men bound whom I need in my end time army. And then he also told us something else which we didn't really understand at the time. He said, if you will join me in this war, and we understood that he was calling us to join him, and we, we did, he said, you will encounter people who are under curses that have been passed down through families from generation to generation but you do not need to be, fear, to be afraid, you will be able to release them. Well, at that time, that was just a statement to Ruth and me. But in the subsequent period of nearly 10 years, we have encountered thousands of people under curses, passed down through families. And God has given us, by his grace, the ability to release them. This confirms to me that this promise, prophecy was from God, because it contained a prediction which we didn't know anything about, which has been absolutely fulfilled. So that's how I've come to know something about witchcraft. As a matter of fact, I had got involved somewhat earlier in brief encounters with witchcraft. At a certain point, I think I could say I was a kind of pioneer in the ministry of deliverance. And I was a very controversial figure at that time. Some people loved me, and some people hated me, but very few people were indifferent. <laughs> and uh, a lot of the cases that I dealt with, the person who needed deliverance had a spirit of witchcraft. Well, I was a pretty orthodox Pentecostal at that time, and I'm still a Pentecostal, but may maybe not quite so orthodox. And... Uh, the people that needed deliverance were somebody like, you know, the pastor's daughter or the deacon's wife or the church soloist. I mean, the last people who ought to have needed deliverance. <laughs> and I really became concerned about this. I said, God, I do hope I'm not getting into something that's not right. So please, I said, would you tell me what is witchcraft? And this is, I believe this is the answer he gave me. Witchcraft is the attempt to control people and make them do what you want by the use of any spirit which is not the Holy Spirit. And then he said, as a kind of corollary, if any, has, any person has a spirit which he or she uses, it is not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is God and no one uses God. I'll say that first part again. Witchcraft, in its essence, is the attempt to control people and make them do what you want by the use of any spirit which is not the Holy Spirit. And when my eyes were opened to that, I saw why the church was full of witchcraft. Because there are a lot of people who 
feel they want people to do something and they use any means they can do to get them to do it. Most of them don't realize what they're doing. Now I want to take three aspects of witchcraft. First of all, as a work of the flesh, which many people don't realize. Second, as an evil spiritual power. And thirdly, the working of witchcraft within the church. Well, let's take it first of all as a work of the flesh. Turn to the list of the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Now, I want to say that in various translations, different words are used. Some translations say witchcraft, some say sorcery, and so on. In just a little while, I'll give you a delineation of the three main branches of witchcraft. That's witchcraft, divination, and sorcery. But you find here in this passage, some translations say witchcraft, some say sorcery. Let me say they're really just different names for the same power. So Paul says in verse 19 of Galatians 5, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery. But the old King James says witchcraft. So there, right in the middle of the list of the works of the flesh, are idolatry and witchcraft. That is, they're the expression of man's carnal, fallen nature. And I say that's the way the flesh, the fallen nature is. We, in our fallen nature, desire to control people. We desire to get people to do what we want. And very often we use illegitimate means to get that. Now this kind of operation, I say, has three key words. And I want you to listen carefully, because wherever you encounter these, these operations, you are encountering witchcraft. And it may be you've never realized it up till now. The three key words are manipulate, intimidate, and dominate. Now the end purpose is dominate, control people, make them do what you want. There are two alternative routes. One is manipulate, the other is dominate. And it depends on the situation and the purpose which route a person will follow. But whether they use manipulation or whether they use domination, the end purpose is, uh, I mean, whether they use intimidation, the end purpose is control, it's domination. Now, in the natural, we're not talking anything about anything supernatural yet, in the natural, witchcraft, as a work of the flesh, operates really in every area of society. Some of you are going to come out of here and you're going to see things in a very different light. I hope the first thing you'll do is look in the mirror. <laughs> Before you point out your husband or your wife or your grandmother or your mother-in-law, whoever it may be, just check on yourself. Okay? Let me give you a few examples. For instance, in the family life. Now, whether people like it or not, God has ordained a certain order in the family. The husband is the head of the wife. People can stand the family up on its head, but God hasn't changed the order. And beneath the authority of husband and wife, there is children who are in God's order, subject to the authority of their parents. Now, what witchcraft will do is use either manipulation or intimidation to set aside the divine authorized order. Let's take children first. Children are master manipulators. You don't have to be old. A child of five can be a master manipulator. All right, suppose mother has guests to tea or coffee, depending on the social situation. And there are biscuits or cookies, depending on your vocabulary. And the little child of five knows that mama doesn't want her to have cookies, biscuits. 
But she knows that when the guests are there, it's going to be very difficult for mother to say no. <laughs> so when the guests are there, she comes in and says, Mama, may I have a cookie? <laughs> and you know, what is the mother going to do? Well, she probably gives way. She's been manipulated. Years and years ago, my first wife and I lived next to a Pentecostal family, father, mother, and I think the daughter was about three years old. Now, in those days, people used to go grocery shopping on Saturday nights. So when they dressed up to go out grocery shopping on Saturday night, the little girl was a little angel. She toddled along happily. When they wanted to go to the Sunday school on Sunday morning, that little creature would lie on its back and scream with her legs in the air to prevent the parents getting to the place where they needed to be. Now that little girl didn't reason, but there was a force in her that had no objection to the parents going to the grocery store, but strongly rejected the parents going to the place where they could hear the Word of God. So you begin to work that out. Uh, a fellow preacher of mine said, a little baby of six weeks is in its cot and it's wet. It needs to have its diaper or its nappy changed. So it cries. Along comes mother, picks up the little baby, changes it, and then cuddles it which of course the baby loves. Well, next time the baby wants to be cuddled, it cries even when its nappy isn't wet. You see, what's that? Manipulation. <laughs> you see, <laughs> this is something natural to fallen man. Well, it's not only children. It can be mothers and fathers. Now, the normal way for a woman to operate is manipulation. Is manipulation. The possible way for a father to operate is t intimidation. See? But each of them has the same aim, control the other. So the wife doesn't get her way. She throws a tearful fit, burns the food, <laughs> and makes her husband's life miserable. So in the end, what does he do? He gives way. Or it's the husband. Now, there's many different ways this can happen, but the husband may be a brute. He may be a strong man with a bad temper, and if he doesn't get his way, he shouts and becomes violent and threatens. And the whole family tiptoes around. The one thing they want to avoid is another fit of temper by daddy. What's he doing? He's intimidating them. What's his aim? To get his way. You see, it can well be that a husband and wife have differences. The divine order is that they talk it out face to face, prayerfully, and seek God. But manipulation never faces the real issue. It always goes round behind. The real issues are never brought out into the light. And there are, um, how knows, who knows how many millions of married couples even in this land, that never really bring their differences out into the open. But each tries to go around behind the other to get what he or she wants. That's manipulation. You take the church. There's many, many examples of manipulation in the church. We'll take a Pentecostal congregation, and I, think, I don't think there's much I don't know about Pentecostals. I mean, I've been an Anglican and I'm a Pentecostal and I think basically I know how they operate. I may be a bit of out, out of date with Anglicans, but I mean, there are all sorts of other people I don't know much about. But anyhow, let's take a little Pentecostal congregation. There's a young pastor. It's his first pastorate. There's only about 100 people in the congregation. And uh, he's a little bit nervous and timid. And there's two very spiritual sisters. I mean, not just spiritual, but super spiritual. <laughs> and um, they know how the church ought to be run. <clears throat> they don't sit down prayerfully and talk it over with the pastor, but one of them gets a tongue, and then the other comes with the interpretation. <laughs> 
And between them, they tell the pastor what to do. <laughs> you think that doesn't happen? I can tell you, it certainly does. <laughs> what is that? Manipulation. That's right. Um, many other areas. Business. People manipulate one another. The boss may manipulate his secretary, or the secretary may manipulate her boss. I can't take a lot of time this evening, but you can see what I'm talking about is something that's natural to fallen man. This is witchcraft as a work of the flesh, and its three trademarks are manipulate, intimidate, and dominate. And I would like to say wherever you encounter those things, behind them is the part of witchcraft. And when your eyes are opened, it's so much easier to deal with it. One of, the, one of the most common tricks of witchcraft is to make you feel guilty. <laughs> well, you didn't come and see me when I was sick. There I was all alone. Never the, regard the fact that the other person had a lot to do. I've learned this. If ever I find the person is making me feel guilty, I stop and ask myself what's working through them. You see, as I understand Scripture, the Holy Spirit does not make people feel guilty. He convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He'll put his finger on a specific thing, say, you did that wrong, this is what you have to do. You have to repent and put it right. But guilt is something that you never finish with. You know, it's, did I really do enough? Ought I to have done more? What did I say wrong? Why doesn't she talk to me in church any longer? Another operation of witchcraft is trying to make you feel that the person's opinion and approval is very important. If you don't do this, I won't approve you. They don't say that, but that's the implication. Again, I've learned to ask myself when I'm confronted with that, is that person's approval really so important to me that I'm going to allow myself to be manipulated by it? And generally, my conclusion is it doesn't matter so much. All right, now we're going to move on. Oh, well, let me point out a connecting link in James chapter 1 and verse 14. You see, this desire for power, for control, and also for knowledge is a strong feature of every human being. And Satan exploits this desire to get power over us. This is what James says in his, his epistle, chapter 1, 14. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire or lust and enticed. So there is in you this desire for power, for control, for appreciation, for knowledge. It's, it's in all of us. It's born in us. But if Satan can begin to use that, he'll get us under his control. See, you couldn't count the number of people in this nation today who are involved in the occult. I'm sure it must be at least 75% of people in this nation today are involved in the occult. What is the motive that Satan uses? The desire for power? the desire for control, and the desire for knowledge. What was the desire that first got the human race into trouble? Have you ever stopped to think? What was Adam desiring in one word? Knowledge. knowledge, that's right. And when he reached out for knowledge in an illegitimate way, he became a captive of Satan. Uncounted millions of people are lured into the account by the desire for knowledge. Where did my son go when he died? What did they end up by doing? going to a seance. Am I going to have a happy marriage? So what do people do? They go to whom? Fortune teller. That's right. That's the motivation. And that's what Satan exploits. Now, let's look at witchcraft as a spiritual power. Now, we're talking about something that's supernatural. It's more than human ability. Very important to understand that not all supernatural comes from God. A lot of it comes from Satan. There are, I believe, only two sources of the supernatural available to man, God or Satan. 
Any supernatural power that does not come from God does come from Satan. As I said before, God's kingdom is a kingdom of light. Usually you know where you're at in God's kingdom. God, Satan's kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. You don't know what's manipulating, what's controlling you, what's driving you. There are, I think, three main branches that we can describe in the English language. In some other languages you might use, have to use different, slightly different terminology. They are witchcraft, divination, and sorcery. And I'll try to give you a little picture of each. I think they cover the whole field of the satanic supernatural. Now, witchcraft is the power arm. Its, its product is power. And it operates through such things as spells and curses. I think perhaps the most single powerful weapon of witchcraft is curses. It's a very old practice. If you go turn to Numbers chapter 22, you find that Balaam was what we would call a witch doctor. Balaam is one of the most difficult types of people to classify that we still encounter today because he was open to supernatural from both sources from God and from Satan. And there are a lot of people like that. And they're the hardest to deal with because sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. If a person's only open to God, he'll always be right. If a person's only open to Satan, it's wrong. But the people that really are difficult to deal with, and we have them in all congregations, are people who are sometimes open to God and sometimes open to Satan. I tell you, for a pastor to deal with them, that requires insight, authority, and courage. Now let's look at what Balak, the king of Moab, said to Balaam, the witch doctor, in Numbers 22, verse 10. Uh, Balaam is actually explaining to God the proposition he's had from Balak. Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. What people was that? Israel, that's right. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. Now this is standard practice in the cultures of the Bible. It was normal for kings or others going to war, not merely to fight them on the natural plane, but to make war on a supernatural plane. And so they would get their witch doctor to curse the other people. There's a list of curses pronounced by the Egyptian pharaohs in the 19th century BC, and there are 66 nations against which they've pronounced curses. See, what's the point of cursing them? You bring them to a place where you can defeat them in war. It's very interesting when Goliath came against David, he cursed them in the name of his cursed him in the name of his gods. That wasn't just a display of vulgarity. He really was asserting, "My gods can deal with your god." So, in a certain sense, ancient warfare was often not just a conflict between nations, but it was viewed as a test of power between the gods of those nations. For instance, when God dealt with Egypt and brought Israel out. The psalm says he judged the gods of Egypt, not just the natural rulers, but the spiritual rulers. So Balak was hired as a good cursor. That was his profession. Ruth and I visited Bath a few years ago, and we, they've just, they had just then excavated a pagan temple. And they discovered that one of the main functions of the priests in that temple was to write curses for people who came. They didn't trust themselves to write a good enough curse for themselves, so the function of the priest was to write a really horrific curse against the person whom they wanted to see destroyed. Uh, don't smile at that. I mean, you can smile and think it's funny, but believe me, in a certain sense, it works. People wouldn't spend thousands of years in a certain way of doing things if there wasn't some reality in it. 
All right, then we look at divination, which uh, in most modern translations is called fortune-telling. This is the knowledge element of witchcraft. This is, the, uh, the product is not now power, but it's knowledge, which as I pointed out was the first desire that led man into sin. And there's a picture in Acts chapter 16, very clear. Acts 16, verses 16 and the following. This is what happened when Paul and Silas first arrived to preach the gospel in Philippi. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us. Now what the Greek actually says is having a spirit, a python, or a python spirit. In other words, a snake spirit. And remember, snakes have always been regarded in pagan society is somehow the source of unusual knowledge and wisdom. There's a well-known lady in Washington, D.C., who is a well-known fortune teller, who in her own autobiography stated that the power came to her when a snake came in bed with her. Now, what I want to point out to you is what this girl said was absolutely true. And she didn't know it by natural means, she knew it by supernatural means. She was just a slave girl. But she brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. Because she was a slave, the profit didn't go to her, it went to her masters. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Wasn't that amazing? It was absolutely true. I've sometimes commented that contemporary missions, that lady might have been made a charter member of the church in Philippi. She was the first person to recognize who Paul and Silas really were. But Paul knew that isn't God's spirit. That's a divining spirit, a fortune-telling spirit. In the end, he turned around, commanded it to come out in the name of Jesus. It came out, and she was no longer able to tell fortunes. Her masters were so angry at the prophets that they'd lost that they brought Paul and Silas before the magistrates. You know the rest of the story. The whole city was in an uproar because a single slave girl was delivered of a spirit of divination. See, at that point, not merely was Paul dealing with Satan's kingdom on the natural, physical plane, but Satan's kingdom in the heavenlies intervened because there strategy against the church was being frustrated. It's a remarkable thing, almost everywhere Paul went, there was a riot. And later, or in, the, in 2 Corinthians, he said, there was an angel of Satan that buffeted me. Now, I, I believe that's exactly correct, it's not a metaphor. There was a satanic angel that organized a riot in every city where Paul went. So, why don't we have riots? Maybe we don't bother Satan enough. I really believe when the church is what it ought to be, there'll be a lot more riots. But there'll also be a lot more revivals. I don't know how many revivals you can have without riots. So you have to decide, is it worth the price? Then there's sorcery. Sorcery, I think, and this is not always used this way, operates through objects, potions, charms, anything that's called lucky, like a lucky horseshoe, all that is occult. The people that carry things that give them luck. It also operates through, you know, love potions, very, very common. I want this man to fall in love with me, so I go to the witch doctor and get a potion, put it in his food, and after that he's going to fall in love with me. And of course, to a certain extent, it works. We, Ruth and I, were in um, Zambia, and we, together with some other brothers and sisters, we offered to pray for all ladies who were barren, couldn't have children. Well, for Africans, that's a real disaster. About 400 ladies gathered in front of us. Before we prayed, someone asked the question, they were all professing Christians, 
How many of you went to the witch doctor for a potion to deliver you from barrenness? And all but two of them raised their hands. See, we're not dealing with something that's very rare and uncommon. They also, po um, sorcery also operates through music. Remember we saw that very probably Lucifer was in charge of the music of heaven. He knows a lot about music. He knows its power. And a lot of contemporary music, what's called acid rock and others, is simply sorcery. That's all you watch a young person that's been listening to that for an hour and their eyes are starey. They've lost contact with the reality. Um, and then another main branch of sorcery is drugs. The Greek word for sorcery is directly formed from the Greek word for a drug. And the whole drug cult, with all its accompaniments of acid rock and so on, is just a clear example of sorcery at work in our culture. And almost all those people, if they come to Jesus, will need to be delivered from that power. In fact, I've come to the place myself where I doubt whether it's much use working with people in that particular stratum of society if you don't understand how to deal with demons. Let's look at just one picture of sorcery. Um, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 21. Well, this describes a future scene, I believe, in human history when God's judgments are being manifested and falling on the wicked. But it says in verse 20 and then 21, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold. Notice idolatry is the first thing. Gold, silver, bro brass, stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear. And notice what goes with idolatry. They did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality. And the word sorceries, the alternative translation in some versions, is drugs. And together with sorcery goes sexual immorality and violence. And the tremendous upsurge of violence in our contemporary civilization is largely the work of sorcery. So when you want to pray about it, don't just pray about the branch you have to deal with the root. Now we come to the third area of this subject which is witchcraft or sorcery within the church. And here's an area where some Christians have no idea what is really going on. I want to turn to Galatians chapter 3 and read a few verses, the first five verses. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Did you ever absorb that fact? They were charismatic Christians, Pentecostal Christians. You'll see, they knew the Lord, they were saved. They had received the Holy Spirit. They were witnessing miracles, but they were bewitched. And this is the standard Greek word for to bewitch. Interestingly enough, it's still used in modern Greek. The word vaskania is the modern Greek word for the evil eye. I happen to know because a Greek Orthodox priest who had come to know the Lord Jesus came to me one years ago and said, pray for me, I want to be delivered from this vaskania. It's exactly the same word that's used here. All right, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? How did Paul know that witchcraft was operating? What was the evidence? Very important. Witchcraft had obscured the revelation they had received of Jesus Christ crucified. That's the supreme aim of witchcraft in the church, is to hide the reality of Jesus Christ crucified. 
Now look at the description of what happened in the following verses. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Notice they had received the Holy Spirit. Paul says, how did you receive it? By keeping the law of Moses or by hearing the gospel with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? I really am inclined to think that text could go up over the entrance of most churches. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Holy Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. Therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you, notice the Spirit was ministered to them, and works miracles among you. Does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So the root problem was the reality of Jesus crucified had been obscured by an evil satanic power that had moved in. And the two problems that resulted were carnality and legalism. They'd gone back to fleshly attempts to do the will of God and please God, to keeping all sorts of rules as a way of achieving righteousness with God. And they had missed the purpose of Christ's death. And the final result is stated in verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue, and all things were written in the book of the law to do them. In other words, Paul says, if you are going back to achieve righteousness by keeping the law, Remember, you've got to keep the whole law all the time or you're under a curse. Because when Israel came into the land of Canaan, one of the first things they had to do was pronounce a curse upon themselves if they did not keep the whole law all the time. See, keeping a little bit of the law some of the time doesn't do you any good. If you're going to be justified by keeping the law, you have to keep the whole law all the time. And none of us in God's sight can ever be justified by the works of law. It's a deception of Satan. It's a deception that appeals primarily to human pride. Because Paul says, Abraham, if he had been justified by works, would have had something to boast of. But not before God, because it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. You see, basically, all of us would like to have something to boast of. In some way or other, we'd like to be a little more righteous than our neighbor. And if we have a set of rules that we're keeping, somehow we can convince ourselves that makes us righteous. When I was in the British Army years ago and came to know the Lord, I became a witness for the Lord. And because I led a life that was so different from my fellow soldiers, lots of them would come up and talk to me. And I would tell them, no, I didn't get religious, I got saved. And then I would tell them a little bit of salvation. You know, the first reaction of almost everyone was they'd start to give me a little list of the rules they kept. <laughs> and each one had a list tailored to his own particular life. You understand? In other words, the first reaction of man confronted with the God's demand for righteousness is, I'll keep a law. I have said many places, and sometimes I'm shocked Christians, Christianity is not a set of rules. Once we reduce it to that, We've lost the vision of the cross. And we've lost the power of God. Now why does Satan want to obscure the cross? L let me just interject this. I personally, as I travel around most of the earth, and I minister to Christians of many different backgrounds, I think there are two main needs in the church. The first is to restore the centrality of the cross of Jesus to its rightful place. Because that's the one thing that totally distinguishes Christianity from any other religion. There is nothing like it in any other religion. And when we displace the cross and its uniqueness, we just go back to living by a set of rules. Human psychology. See, psychology can tell you what's wrong but it can't enable you to do what's right. That power comes only from one source, which is the cross. 
The other, and it's a related problem, is the church needs to give Jesus back his headship. Because God made him head over all things to the church. And the problem is that basically the church does not really acknowledge the headship of Jesus. The head is the thing that makes the decision. The body follows. In how many churches are the decisions really made by Jesus through the Holy Spirit? How many churches actually ever invite Jesus to make the decisions? Let alone listen to what he has to say. What's the problem? What's the force at work? You tell me. Witchcraft, that's right. Now you see, I've given you a diagnosis. If you will use this diagnosis, it will totally change your attitude and your perspective on many of the things that concern you most closely. Because Satan likes to operate in the dark. He doesn't like people to know what he's doing or how he's doing it. I tell you that I have faced tremendous personal opposition to preaching this particular message here tonight. And I know why. Because this message is bringing out into the light things that Satan doesn't want to be brought out into the light. Whether it's the nature of witchcraft in the natural, as a work of the flesh, or whether it's the nature of witchcraft in the supernatural. And the last thing he wants is for Christians to realize that witchcraft is at work in the church. Why does Satan want to obscure the cross? Let me give you three reasons. It's the only basis of all God's provision for his redeemed people. There is no other basis. Hebrews 10, 14 says, For by one sacrifice God has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. By the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, God has done all that will ever be needed for any human being in any period of history. It's all done through the cross. Now, our appropriation of the cross is progressive. We are being sanctified. What Jesus has done is perfect, finished, complete. But our appropriation is progressive. I don't believe there's a single person here, myself included, who has yet appropriated all that is available to us through the cross. But if we will go through the process of sanctification, being made holy, being conformed to God, thinking God's thoughts, living his way, we will appropriate more and more. But if witchcraft moves in, witchcraft will obscure the cross and although we should be living like children of the king, we'll begin living like beggars and paupers. Because all the benefits that God has provided come to us solely on the basis of the cross. Satan is very astute. He knows exactly what to strike at. He knows that if he can obscure the cross, he has the church at his mercy. The second reason is that the cross was the means of Satan's total defeat. I can't go into all the scriptures, but through the cross, Jesus ministered a total, eternal, irreversible defeat to Satan. Satan can't change that. But what he can try to do is conceal the fact from us so that we no longer live in the victory because we don't realize the victory that was won for us. The third feature of the cross is it's the only source of power for real Christian living. You can quote the Sermon on the Mount as much as you like, and all sorts of psychiatrists will say, well, that's the way people ought to live. But the only way we get the ability to live that way is through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Because his sacrifice dealt with the old man, the fleshly nature. Paul says, our old man was crucified with him. And he says a little later on in Galatians, those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. Until you learn to apply the cross to your carnal nature, it masters you. You cannot master it. Paul says in Romans 6, our old man was crucified that we should no longer be the slaves of sin. That's the provision of the cross. That I've, I've mentioned I have an Anglican background, and I thank God for many wonderful things that came to me through that. But I know some of you here will appreciate this in those days, which are long ago. 
we used to have the general confession about 11.15 every Sunday morning. And one of the things we used to say was, pardon us, miserable offenders. And I used to look at the people around me and think, well, <laughs> that's surely a good description. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought to myself, what good is religion if it only makes you a miserable offender? And my ultimate conclusion was, I can be an offender without religion and not nearly so miserable. So that was what I did. <laughs> but you see, another thing I said to myself was, I can confess my sins on Sunday morning, but I know I'm going to go out this week and commit the same sins. Am I pleasing God by confessing sins I'm going to go on committing? No, I wasn't insincere. I was just ignorant. I didn't know that there'd been a provision made to put that old rebel inside me to death. But it's made through the cross. Now, let me read what I've written here. Instead of the power that comes from the cross, witchcraft substitutes fleshly effort and legalistic means. You make ten rules and people don't keep them, so you say, we'll have 20 rules. And they keep still fewer, so you make 40 rules. But making rules doesn't make people righteous. Do you know that? Judaism today has 613 commandments. And one of my grandsons is part of a very ultra-religious Orthodox Jewish group. And they say, we keep 32 of them. <laughs> And I mean, they keep more than anybody else. The truth of the matter is we can have all the rules, but we don't keep them. Going back to rules is the effect of witchcraft in our lives. I personally believe that this has happened in almost every major section of the church. You can disagree with me. I think every major move of God in the church produced something that was significant, lively, powerful, but within a generation or two, they lost the vision of the cross and they went into carnal effort and rules and organization and such things. Let me close by quoting Jeremiah 17. Cursed is the man who makes flesh his arm who trusts in man and whose heart departs from the Lord. See, that's the curse that witchcraft brings upon the church. We are no longer trusting in the supernatural grace and power of God. We're trusting in the best we can do with our own efforts. If you would like information about further teaching resources available from Derek Prince Ministries UK, please call us and request a copy of our latest resource guide on 01462 492 100. You may also visit our website at www.dpmuk.org or write to us at DPMUK, Kingsfield, Hadrian Way, Baldock, SG7 6AN. In this four-part series entitled, The Enemies We Face, Derek Prince identifies witchcraft with its many forms and manifestations as the universal religion of fallen man. He explores this theme and gives practical strategy for achieving victory over these enemies. Now, The Enemies We Face, Part 3, The Spirit of Antichrist. This is the third in a series of talks on the theme of the enemies we face. In our first two talks, we dealt, first of all, with the nature and the structure of Satan's kingdom. I pointed out that there are two opposing spiritual kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, both of them spiritual, both of them at this time invisible to the natural eye, but extremely real. And we attempted to trace the origin of Satan's kingdom to a to an archangel, originally named Lucifer, who led a group of angels in rebellion against God and set up a rival kingdom in a region which is called, in the New Testament, the heavenlies. That phrase, the heavenlies, actually occurs five times in the epistle to the Ephesians, which is the main section of scripture that unfolds God's revelation of the church. 
I think it's no accident that the emphasis there is on the heavenlies. The Church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be operating in the heavenlies against another kingdom also established in the heavenlies. And for the benefit of those who are confused, I would like to point out that in the Bible from the first verse onwards, the word heaven is plural. There is more than one heaven. And somewhere between our planet and God's throne and the heaven of God's presence, there is a rival satanic kingdom in opposition to God. And then we dealt in the second talk with one of the main activities of the satanic kingdom, one of the main ways its power is manifested, which is witchcraft. For many people, witchcraft has a kind of old-fashioned sound, like something from the Middle Ages, which has long ceased to be relevant, but that is totally untrue. Witchcraft is very real, and I think has never been more active in human history than it is today. And in many nations, which a generation ago would have been described as Christian, are today pervaded with intense activity by witchcraft. I tried to give a brief definition of witchcraft in three areas. First of all, as a work of the flesh, one of the ways that man's fallen nature expresses itself, and I gave the three key words to manipulate, to intimidate, and to dominate. The aim of witchcraft simply is to control other people and get them to do what you want them to do. And it is not, does not use legitimate means. Witchcraft is closely allied with rebellion. It's the outworking of man's rebellion against God. In the second area, witchcraft is a sort of supernatural satanic religion with many different aspects and phases. And uh, the priest of witchcraft in most countries is called the witch doctor. And you cannot find a single uh, area of the earth's surface where people have not been engaged in witchcraft, mostly from time immemorial. And in many, many areas of the world, it is still the prevailing spiritual activity. And then thirdly, we dealt with witchcraft in the church, which is one of Satan's master strokes. Paul wrote to the Galatian Christians and he said, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And we saw that the evidence that they were bewitched consisted of the fact that the work of Jesus on the cross had been obscured. And through that, they had been deprived of all the benefits that Jesus had obtained for them. And this work of witchcraft, witchcraft expressed itself in the church in two main things. Carnality, relying on the flesh rather than on the spirit, and an outworking of carnality, legalism. And I suggest to you, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, that very possibly most of the professing Christian church answers to that description. It has turned away from the supernatural grace and power of the Holy Spirit, resorts now on human methods, human efforts, and uh, is, in a sense, tied up in all sorts of legalistic systems. I've told people in some places that Christianity is not a set of rules. And sometimes people have looked at me in amazement. I think they could almost more easily have accepted the statement if I'd said there is no God. Well, this evening we're going on to the next main outworking of Satan's kingdom and Satan's opposition to God and to the Church of Jesus Christ. And we're going to deal with something that I have headed, the spirit of Antichrist. We need to turn, first of all, to the passage in 1 John where this is primarily described. 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. 1 John 2, 18. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. 
by which we know that it is the last hour. Notice that the advent and the working of the spirit of Antichrist is going to intensify the closer we get to the, the end of the age. They, that's these Antichrists, went out from us, uh, us being the church of Jesus, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Or an alternative reading, you all know, which is probably the right one. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. We see there that, let me first of all try and just briefly explain the real meaning of that strange phrase, Antichrist. You need to bear in mind, first of all, that the word Christ is from a Greek word, Christos, which exactly corresponds to the Hebrew word Mashiach, from which we get Messiah. It's amazing how many Jews and Christians do not realize that Messiah and Christ are two different words for the same thing. So when we say Antichrist, that means anti-Messiah. And it's probably easier for us to get the picture if we use the phrase Messiah. So, and then again, the, the preposition, I hope you know what a preposition is, if you don't, don't worry. Uh, you can get by without it. Heaven is open to those who don't know what prepositions are. <laughs> but anyhow, the preposition anti is a Greek preposition, and it has two meanings, and both of them apply. First of all, it means against. So the first operation is against Messiah. The second meaning is in place of. And so the ultimate purpose is to put a false Messiah in place of the true Messiah. So this force operates first of all by excluding Messiah and secondly by replacing him by a false Messiah. So the total operation is in two phases. And when you begin to recognize that, I think you will see that the spirit of Antichrist is extremely active almost throughout the whole professing church. Ruth and I have friends in America who belong to a church which would be called in the old line evangelical stream. I don't want to name the denomination. And they said to me one day, they said, in our church, you can talk about Buddha, you can talk about Socrates, you can talk about Plato, you can talk about Martin Luther King, and no one gets upset. But if you talk about Jesus, everybody gets upset. Now what is that? It's the spirit of Antichrist, see? It's in its first phase, getting rid of the true Messiah. But we all need to bear in mind that that's not the end of, of Satan's purpose. His purpose is to replace the true Messiah by a false Messiah. So that's what we're dealing with. It becomes obvious when you see that, that this particular operation of Satan is only applicable where Jesus has been preached. You cannot reject Jesus if you've never heard about Jesus. So witchcraft is different. Witchcraft belongs to the whole fallen human race. It is, in fact, as I said, the universal religion of the fallen race with many different manifestations and forms and ceremonies. But Antichrist can only be manifested where Christ has first been preached. In the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry, it's recorded in Matthew's Gospel that he said to Satan, get behind me, which is the normal way to translate it. But it is perfectly possible to translate that, follow behind me. And I believe that is a spiritual reality. 
that wherever Jesus and the gospel are proclaimed, God will permit the opposite claim to follow. In fact, humanity is going to be forced to choose between the true Messiah and the false. It's part of God's way of dealing with us that he doesn't exclude the false options. And it's our responsibility to make the right choice. I think this is extremely relevant to our generation. I believe this generation, in one form or another, is going to have to make a decision, true Messiah or false Messiah. And the spirit of Antichrist is extremely active, much more than most of you have any idea, pressuring us into the wrong decision. Now, in this passage that we've read in 1 John chapter 2, maybe we should read 1 John chapter 4, just two verses also, verses 2 and 3. 1 John 4, verses 2 and 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus the Messiah has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus the Messiah has come in the flesh is not of God. Now some of you with alternative translations will have a shorter version. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus the Messiah. The meaning is the same. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard was coming and now is already in the world. If we look at the two passages together, we see there are three forms of Antichrist. First of all, there are many Antichrists. And in the course of human history, many, many Antichrists have appeared and been manifested. I'll speak briefly about just a few of them in a little while. Secondly, there is the Antichrist, not many but just one specific. That, I believe, is the final manifestation, the final product of the spirit of Antichrist, which has not yet been, as I far as I know, revealed in human history. I often say to people, I think his shadow has already fallen across the stage, but we haven't seen the actual person. But at the end of this age, Scripture makes it clear there will be one final supremely evil, supremely powerful ruler who will dominate the whole human race for a brief period, who will be the Antichrist. The third form is the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is the spirit that operates through every Antichrist. And John has given us certain marks of the spirit of Antichrist which are very important. First of all, it starts in association with God's people. For John says in first epistle of John chapter 2 verse 19, they, the Antichrists, went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. So, Antichrist always begins in some way in association with the people of God, but doesn't really belong there, and in due course, that will be made manifest. That's one mark of the spirit of Antichrist. The second one is that it denies that Jesus is the Messiah. 1 John 2, verse 22, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? He is Antichrist. And then John continues with the third mark. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. This is very important. Antichrist does not deny the existence of God. In fact, he claims to be God's representative. What he does deny is the relationship of the Father and the Son within the Godhead. And wherever you encounter the denial of that, you are probably facing the spirit of Antichrist. And the fourth mark of Antichrist, which is given in 1 John chapter 4, is that it denies Messiah has come. Probably believes in a Messiah who will come, but denies that Messiah has already come. Let me recapitulate those four marks, because they're extremely important. 
First of all, Antichrist starts in association with God's people. Second, it denies that Jesus is the Messiah. Obviously, that cannot be paganism, because paganism hasn't even heard of Jesus. You understand? It can only take place where Jesus has been proclaimed. Third, it denies the father-son relationship within the Godhead. Does not necessarily deny God, but denies a God who is revealed as father and son. And fourth, it denies that Messiah has come, but very likely teaches that Messiah will come. Now, let's take some historical examples. And I have to confess, what I'm going to say is somewhat controversial. The problem with the truth is, it's liable to be controversial. I have certainly no desire to offend anybody. And I have no particular desire to attack other religions. What I want to do is present the truth. But the first and most persistent and long-standing manifestation of the spirit of Antichrist is in Judaism. Uh, we always used to think that Christianity kind of branched off from Judaism. And that's what the Jewish people basically will tell you. Let me say I'm not Jewish, although my wife is, and we are very, very close to the Jewish people. I've come to see that that isn't true. What has happened is Christianity that's the teaching of Jesus and his disciples, not a whole lot of churchianity that's followed ever since. But the teaching of Jesus and his disciples is the true continuation of the religion of the Old Testament. And Judaism has branched off from it, you see? That's a very important thing to see, especially if you're dealing with Jewish people, as we often are. So that's the first mark. It started in association with the people of God. Actually, if you, I'm, I'm no expert on Judaism, but if you analyze its teaching, much of it is an unacknowledged refusal to believe in Jesus. A great deal of what is taught is a way of denying the claims of Jesus. The second uh, manifestation of Antichrist in Judaism, of course, is very simple. It denies that Jesus is the Messiah, but it believes in a Messiah who is to come. Third, it denies the father-son relationship within the Godhead. It rejects the claim of Jesus to be the Son of God and does not accept that God has a son. And fourthly, as I've said, it denies that Messiah has come. Interestingly, just to make this up to date, this past summer, 1988, in Jerusalem, very elegant posters appeared in the city on all the main streets of the city in Hebrew saying this, Messiah has come. And if you want to meet him, go to the Mount of Olives on a certain Sunday and he'll be there. <laughs> Beautifully printed. I have no idea who printed them. I do know one journalist went there to see what would happen, but he didn't find Messiah. But that's just to show you how real this issue is. If you talk to Jewish people in a sympathetic attitude and you use the name Messiah, something changes in their eyes because it's a word that has a special significance for Jewish people. Now I want to offer you a suggestion a thought that I have. You're perfectly free to disagree with me. But I want to turn to Matthew chapter 27 for a moment and just read one verse. I suggest to you that in this verse we have the first actual powerful manifestation of the spirit of Antichrist. Matthew 27 verse 21. Jesus has been brought before the governor Pontius Pilate Pilate can find nothing wrong with Jesus, but the Jewish religious leaders persist in accusing him and accusing him and stir up the whole Jewish multitude to turn against him. 
And we need to bear in mind that many of those people in that multitude must have been in the same multitude that just one week earlier had welcomed him to Jerusalem, put palm branches in the way, and said, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Which illustrates something that I think we not, ought not to ignore, that humanity is extremely fickle. <laughs> Didn't take them more than one week to totally reverse their attitude. But I don't believe it was just a natural human reaction. I believe that there was a tremendous spiritual war going on in the unseen realm. And unfortunately, the spirit of Antichrist prevailed. And this is what happened. Uh, the governor Pontius Pilate brought Jesus out and said, it's, it's your privilege that I release one prisoner to you at this season every year. Shall I release Jesus or shall I re release Barabbas? Barabbas was a political agitator, a murderer, a man of violence. He'd never done anybody any good. Whereas on the other hand, Jesus had never done anybody any harm. He had healed thousands, blessed thousands, fed thousands. And there was no logical reason whatever to turn against Jesus. It was not logic. It was a spiritual force at work. And this, I believe, is the key verse, Matthew 27, 21. The governor, that's Pilate, answered and said to them, the Jewish crowd, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And so Israel is a kind of antitype of what will happen to humanity, in my opinion. Because I believe all humanity, ultimately, is going to be faced with this choice. Which of the two? Do you want Jesus, the Savior, the Healer, the Righteous One? Or do you want Barabbas, a wicked, violent, political agitator? In a certain sense, Barabbas is a type of the Antichrist. And they chose, whom did they choose? Barabbas. Listen, let's not point a finger at them. Let's be very careful that when the time comes, we don't make the same mistake. There was a spiritual force at work that swept through that crowd and changed them. And they became almost insane with anger, jealousy, and rage without any cause whatever. And I personally believe that's when the spirit of Antichrist first impacted humanity. And it has, in a sense, sought to dominate the Jewish people from then until now. Now, Jesus warned them. If you turn to John chapter 5, John 5 and verse 43. They were, at this point, disputing his claim to be the Messiah and the Son of God. And Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Now that has been proved abundantly true. In other words, I am the true Messiah, but you won't receive me. If a false Messiah will come in his name, you will receive him. And the Jewish Encyclopedia records approximately 40 false Messiahs who have come since then and been received by Jewish people. To name just one or two or three of them, the most famous probably is Bar Kokhba, who led a revolt against Rome in the year 138 A.D., I believe. Then there was Moses of Crete, I think about the 5th century, who persuaded people that they should wade out into the sea from Crete and they'd meet the Messiah, and thousands of them waded out into the sea and were drowned. And then in the year 1666, which was supposed to be the miraculous year, Sabbatai Tzvi claimed to be the Messiah and was enthusiastically received by multitudes. One of the false teachings of Judaism, it's not taught by all of Judaism, but it is a teaching in Judaism, 
is that the one who gives us back our temple is the Messiah. You know, I'm sure, that the temple area, the sacred site of all Jewish people, is still occupied by a Muslim mosque. And the Jews are not even permitted to go there, although they actually control politically the whole area. And I personally believe that if a political personality would arise that could somehow intervene in the Middle East and obtain for the Jewish people the right to build their temple there, they would enthusiastically hail him as Messiah. And he would appeal to the whole community of Jewish people worldwide. And I would suggest that that might not be very far away. All right, now let's look at another main manifestation of the spirit of Antichrist. And this is one that's extremely important for us as Christians to be well informed about at this time. And that is Islam, which is the name for the religion of Muhammad. Islam means um, perfection, completeness, fulfillment. Uh, Muhammad arose in the seventh century of this, era, of this era in the Arabian Peninsula, claimed to be a prophet, claimed to receive in a cave from an archangel the revelation of the religion which then became Islam. And he claimed that his religion, Islam, was the true fulfillment of the Old and the New Testament. He claimed that the Christians in the Gospels had perverted the real truth, but he, through Islam, was restoring it. That's the basic claim of Muhammad. And he first believed that because he rejected idolatry and because he rejected the claims of Christianity, the Jewish people would follow him. But he was disappointed. And when they didn't follow him, he turned against them and became a persecutor of them. Now, let's consider the teachings of Islam. Personally, this is my own opinion. At the m present moment, I think Islam is the most sinister, powerful force opposing the truth of God at work in the world. It's a it's tragedy that so many Christians in the West have totally misunderstood and underestimated Islam. If it once gains power, it will first and foremost suppress the Jews, and second, suppress the Christians. In Muslim countries throughout the centuries, Christians and Jews have been given the title Dhimmi, which means second-class people. It rather suits Islam to have some of them around, but to keep them in such a low and debased condition that the superiority of Islam is manifest to everybody. Ruth and I were in Pakistan in 1985 with a, preaching the gospel there. One of the first things that happened was we were taken to visit the Jewish community, the, I'm sorry, the Christian community in Karachi. And I still remember the awful sense of physical sickness when I saw the squalor, the poverty, the debased condition. They had open sewers running in the streets. They just went to the toilet out in the open. And this was the picture of Christianity presented to the people of Pakistan. It suited them, you understand? They didn't want to eliminate them totally. They just wanted to demonstrate the total superiority of Muslims over Christians. For instance, Muslims will never clean latrines. So all cleaners of latrines in Pakistan are Christians. That's basically the Pakistani vision of Christianity. See? And this is just one of countless examples of how the Jews and the Christians have been a totally suppressed, inferior minority in Islamic countries. Uh, the 
oath of a Christian is not accepted in Islamic courts. The evidence of a Christian against a Muslim is not accepted. It's true that Islam has not been guilty of anything so terrible as the Holocaust but it has a long record of 13 centuries of suppression and contempt for Christianity. It's hard for you who are not familiar to realize with what total contempt they view Christians. You see, the things that we, through Christian inheritance and tradition, regard as excellent, like mercy and forgiveness, to Muslims, they're just weakness. You see, <laughs> at the present time, the situation in the Middle East, Western politicians, even if they're not Christians, have got a Christian viewpoint. They have a background. They talk about mercy, peace, forgiveness. To the, to the Muslims, that's nonsense. In the Muslim thinking, revenge is a sacred duty. I just want to bring out the, the, the totally different spirit that there is because it's not always obvious. Now, as I pointed out, Islam again has the marks, most of them. It started in association with the Old and the New Testament. It claimed to be the outworking of that revelation of God. But it denies certain basic fundamentals of the Christian faith. It denies the atoning death of Jesus on the cross. Muhammad taught that Jesus didn't die. An angel came and spirited him away from the cross before he died. Because there is no death, there is no atonement. And because there is no atonement, there is no forgiveness. And no Muslim has the assurance of sins forgiven at any time. Second, and this they deny with fanatical intensity, that Jesus is the Son of God. You can talk to the Muslims about Jesus as a prophet and they'll give you careful attention. In fact, the Quran acknowledges Jesus as a prophet. But when you, even as a savior, even as a messiah, but when you say he's the son of God, you bring out the most intense, bitter opposition. In the famous mosque on the, that's called the Dome of the Rock that's built on the side of the what was the Temple of Solomon at one time, in the Arabic inscriptions around it, twice it says, God has no need of a son. Uh, until you've encountered this, you have no idea of the intensity of the opposition to this. And then, as I've said, it denies the father-son relationship within the Godhead. So, interestingly enough, you see, both these two religions that we've looked at, Judaism and Islam, originate in the Middle East. They will, if you go on a tour in Israel and you have a guide, they'll probably tell you at some point that the Middle East is the origin of the three great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's my guess, and I just offer this as something for you to think about, that the spirit of Antichrist will succeed in the professing Christian church in eliminating Jesus. It will ultimately, we'll have a Christianity without Jesus. It will be a moral system, a legal system, a system full of all sorts of pageants and religion, but without Jesus. And you see, once you've eliminated Jesus, you've opened the way for a synthesis of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I'm inclined to think this is just a personal opinion, that the Antichrist will head up such a religion, uniting Judaism, Islam, and apostate Christianity. I think we're a very long way toward it. When you consider that both the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury have in recent years conducted in Christian churches ceremonies where Islam and Islamic priests 
and all sorts of Hindus, American Indians, were all welcomed as brothers together. See, you can just read that in the newspaper, but that is the spirit of Antichrist. Its purpose is to eliminate Jesus. He's the stumbling block. The cross is the stumbling block. Do away with Jesus and the cross and Christianity can merge with all sorts of religions. And I personally think we're, long, we're far on the way toward that. That's my personal opinion. And I think we have to be very cautious in our attitude and our approach to these things. Because I think the spirit of deception is at work. Then, as I say, there have been many lesser anti-Christian persons or systems. For instance, about 30 years ago, I was in Kenya in educational work. And I personally have a great respect, in a way, for Jomo Kenyatta, the first president of Kenya. But in the period leading up to the independence of Kenya, under the, what they call the Mau Mau uprising, you probably remember the word Mau Mau, um, the, the followers of Mau Mau took all the Christian hymns that the missionaries had taught them and reworded them, putting Jomo in place of Jesus. See? So that is again just a simple example of the spirit of Antichrist. I'm not saying Jomo was an antichrist because I think he was a good man in some ways, or he was never a Christian, but I think he did a good job. I don't want to be lined up as a critic of him. But the spirit that was at work was the spirit of antichrist. Now, let's come to the final manifestation of the spirit of antichrist in the Antichrist. Now we're dealing with something that as far as I know is still future. If it isn't future, I haven't discovered it yet. So there's always a possibility of error. And I'm not by any means laying down the law claiming that everything will be exactly the way I, pr I present it. But I want to direct your attention to these very important passages of Scripture so that at least you are not ignorant of them that you're not unaware of what Satan is planning. And you may be able to form some opinion about how far he's come in carrying out his plans. We'll turn first of all to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which really is mainly given over to dealing with the uh, appearance, revelation, manifestation of Antichrist. It's also dealing with preparation for the Lord's return. And of course, they're very closely intertwined because the final satanic act before the return of the Lord will be the Antichrist. In fact, Paul says the Lord will destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. Personally, I have no real aim to be a hero. Uh, I'm prepared to let Jesus deal with the Antichrist myself. I think he's the only one who can. I think the true Christ, the true Messiah, will deal with the false when he comes. I think that's one of the main purposes of his coming, is to defeat and cast down and overthrow the Antichrist. Anyhow, if we turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, and just reading to verse 3. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the theme of this passage. And the word coming there is parousia in Greek, which is the word which is normally used for the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him as the church, which is to be caught up to meet him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled. Don't be disturbed. Don't be deceived either by spirit, that is a false prophecy or a false teacher, or by word as some prophetic message that circulates, like the one that's been circulating recently, that Jesus was coming on the 12th of September, was it the 12th of September? You know, I just 
amazed. I don't know whether this circulated in Britain, but multitudes of Christians believed it in the United States. It shows to me the appalling, abysmal ignorance of at least American Christians. And I don't know whether Christians in other nations are much better. I'm really not, not prepared to say. I mean, there were thousands of people who believed this teacher who said that Jesus was coming on Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year. I don't suppose they're really embarrassed that he didn't come. That's the amazing thing. They can still go on believing people after they've been totally wrong. Anyhow. I just understand why Paul wrote these words. Don't be shaken or troubled, either by spirit or by word, or by letter as if from us. See the, the nerve of Satan, that he was capable of getting people to write letters in Paul's name, sign them with Paul's name as if they were written by Paul. I had a friend once who, uh, a minister, he's still a friend of mine in fact, and uh, he used to circulate, yeah, he's a very good brother, if I gave you his name most of you would know him, he used to circulate his own teaching tapes when he was pastor of a certain church. Well, a certain group who had a very erroneous doctrine got his tapes and on the blank side recorded their own teaching without saying anything, returned it to him, and after that when the church lent out the pastor's teaching, they were also lending out on the same tape this completely erroneous teaching. See. Don't imagine that Satan doesn't have nerve. He has endless nerve. There's no limit to his nerve. All right, going on. Don't be deceived as though the day of Christ had come. Some people were teaching it had already come, even then. Let no one deceive you by any means, and I'd like to say that to every one of you. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The word falling away in Greek is apostasia. It means an apostasy. It means a deliberate rejection of revealed truth. And I think we are living in the days of apostasy. I'll come to that a little later. Unless the apostasy comes first and the man of sin or man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition, so there's two further titles of the Antichrist. He's the man of lawlessness. He's the supreme embodiment of man's rebellion against God and rejection of God's laws. And he's the son of perdition, the one who's headed for a lost eternity. It's interesting, there's only one other person in the New Testament who's called the son of perdition. You know who that is? Judas. Judas Iscariot. And you see, he was a false apostle. So we see here again the implication that this person will start in association in some way with the Christian church. Personally, I think he'll be charismatic. Super charismatic. I mean, I really mean that. All right. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. We won't go any further with that for a moment. But there we have now three different names for the same being, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition. And we have one other important name in Revelation 13. Let's turn to Revelation 13, beginning in the middle of verse 1. <clears throat> this is part of the vision that John had in this revelation. I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Who is the dragon? Satan, that's right, that's absolutely clear. So here is some person that's going to arise to whom Satan will give his power. Why will Satan give his power to this person? Because that will enable this person to gain the dominion over the entire human race and to either persuade or force the entire human race to do the one thing that Satan wants most, which is worship him. See, this is his goal. He's been working at it 
patiently and perseveringly for many, many centuries, and he's very near the achievement of his goal at this time. Going on, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. There is a sort of false resurrection here. I don't know whether this person will be assassinated, he will apparently be dead, and he will return to life. What would have happened in America if John Kennedy had come back to life after his assassination? There wouldn't have been many people that would have not sold themselves to John Kennedy. Going on, verse 4. So they, that's the people of the earth, worship the dragon, who's that? Satan. Satan. Who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? That's the fourth title, the beast, the wild beast. It's a word in Greek that means a wild creature, a, an animal of prey, such as a leopard or a lion or one of those. Now, in Revelation, there is a very deliberate contrast between two persons. The wild beast, who's Satan's ruler, and the lamb, who is God's ruler. And I think it's very important for all of us to bear this in mind in our spirit that we do not cultivate the nature of the beast, but we have to cultivate the nature of the lamb. You see, when the Holy Spirit descended at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus and looked for somebody to settle on, what nature did he look for? The lamb, that's right. For John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, and on him the Holy Spirit descended. See, I think this is one of the great issues that concerns every one of us. Because in the world today, it's so competitive, it's so intense, people are so extreme and violent that it's pretty easy to let the nature of the beast begin to infiltrate us. But what God wants in us is the nature of the Lamb. Let's look at a little picture of the Lamb in Revelation 5. We could read quite a lot, but we'll, we'll probably not read too far. Beginning at verse 5. Uh, John had had this vision of a scroll in the hand of God, and there was no one who was found worthy to open the scroll. And so John was weeping. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. This is dramatic, really, because John was looking for a lion. But what did he see? And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. So the, the lion is a lamb. That's a deliberate um, contradiction. So God's appointed ruler doesn't have the nature of the beast. He has the nature of the lamb. And he's highly exalted above all others because he laid down his life, because he humbled himself, because he went the way of meekness, humility, because he didn't resist his arresters and his persecutors. And I really believe that the church in these days is going to have to display the same nature. And I, I mean, I don't believe it's easy. I, I suggest to you this. It's not a popular suggestion. I think the church may go home the same way as her Lord, by the way of the cross. I think we'll conquer, as the, as the hymn says, when we yield. God's strength will be made perfect in our weakness. I believe that's a lesson we're going to have to learn. And there's a lot of teaching in the church today that talks about all we can do and all our power and all that faith can accomplish. But I believe it really is inflating the natural man, the fleshly nature, and that nature has to be crucified before we can enter into God's purpose for us. We could go on with the worship of the Lamb, but I think you can read that for yourself. Let's return now to Revelation 13 and just look at a glimpse of a few
parts of this description. Uh, we've seen that they all worshipped the beast. And they were all convinced it was hopeless to make war with the beast. Now, who knows how that will be brought about. But suppose a world ruler, ruler came to power who accumulated all the nuclear weapons and no one else was allowed to have any. Well, nobody would make war with him. It would be suicide even to contemplate it. I'm not saying it'll happen, but what I'm trying to point out to you is the situation that's pictured here is, could be very close. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. He is the open challenger of God. He's not a secret enemy. He shakes his fist in the face of Almighty God. And again, we have a kind of attitude like that very close to us today. And it was granted to him, by whom? I presume by God. It's a frightening thought. It was granted to him to make war with the saints. Who are the saints? I suppose that's us. I hope it's us. And yet and when I say I hope it's us, it's kind of ambiguous hope, isn't it? I mean, I want to be a saint, but I, do I want the beast to make war with me? And, well, you may have to choose between two options. He was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. See, I want to instill into your thinking that Christianity is not all easy victory. In fact, I think in a sense, included in our faith is the willingness to be apparently overcome, defeated but not really defeated. You see, Jesus cares very little about the opinion of this world. Have you ever thought about that? What was his last public appearance? As a corpse on a cross. And he's never sought to create that appearance. He's never reappeared except to people who believe in him. How much do we care about the opinion of the world? Do we care more than that? Paul said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of Jesus Christ, by which the world is crucified to me and I to the world. All right, let's go on a little further. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's a dramatic statement. The whole human race will worship him, except those whom God has chosen for himself whose names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation of the world. Then we see this other very sinister person who's briefly, whom we'll just glance at briefly here, the second beast. We're going on now in verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming out of, up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. He appeared to be a lamb, but he had really the voice of a dragon. I believe this is a religious person. Generally speaking, he's called the false prophet. And I believe that false religion is going to as align itself with a false messiah. And I suggest to you that this is already happening. For instance, in China, where the official free self movement under Bishop Ding at the present time has aligned itself totally with the atheistic communist government and is the main persecutor of the real Christians. I think very much the same happened in Soviet Russia, where the head of the Russian Orthodox Church totally endorsed Stalin, and is now having an embarrassing time deciding what to say about it. See, I believe that the political ruler will appreciate the importance of religion and will co-opt religion in its false form to support his power. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. We, we don't have time to go into that in detail, but notice the false trinity. See, the, the, the ancient church in the, in the Middle Ages that used Latin used to say, Diabolus simius Dei. The devil is the ape of God. He really never comes up with anything totally new. All he can do is make a bad copy of what God has done. But there is a false trinity, you see? Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. And they produce an image which in a sense is a false church, you see? 
All right. And let's go back to Second Thessalonians chapter two quickly in closing. Second Thessalonians chapter two. And we go back to that key verse, verse three. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day the coming of the Lord will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. Now, as I said, the word falling away is the Greek word from which we get the English word apostasy. And its primary meaning is a deliberate rejection of revealed truth. I suggest to you that we are surrounded by apostasy in the world today. All through the centuries, there have been churchmen and church leaders who've been wicked, immoral, covetous, but they have not openly denied the great basic truths of the Christian faith. In fact, those truths have been the means they use to support their power. But in this century, starting, I think, probably in Germany, we have today church leaders, official representatives of the churches, who have denied all the great basic truths of the Christian faith. The deity of Jesus, his virgin birth, his atoning death, his physical resurrection, and his coming again. And many of them have occupied and do occupy positions of honor and authority in the professing Christian church. In Britain, as you know, I think two-thirds of the bishops of the Anglican church have basically line themselves with those statements made originally by the Bishop of Durham. I'm not aiming at anybody. I'm simply pointing out this is a feature of this century which I don't believe existed in any previous century. I believe that we are already <coughs> confronted with the apostasy. And you see the church is the bulwark against error. So Satan has to penetrate the church before he can break through with his error. If you would like information about further teaching resources available from Derek Prince Ministries UK, please call us and request a copy of our latest resource guide on 01462 492 100. You may also visit our website at www.dpmuk.org. Or write to us at DPM UK, Kingsfield, Hadrian Way, Baldock, SG7 6AN. In this four-part series entitled The Enemies We Face, Derek Prince identifies witchcraft with its many forms and manifestations as the universal religion of fallen man. He explores this theme and gives practical strategy for achieving victory over these enemies. Now, The Enemies We Face, Part 4, The Church's Victory. This is the fourth and final session of our series of talks on the theme of The Enemies We Face. We, of course, being God's people, the Church of Jesus Christ. In the previous two talks, I've dealt with what I believe to be the two main enemies that confront the Church today. The first is witchcraft. The second is the spirit or the power of Antichrist. Witchcraft I defined as really the universal religion of fallen humanity. The means by which men through all the ages have sought to make contact with Satan's rebellious kingdom of angels in the heavenlies, worshipping them in some way or other as gods. Antichrist is a different kind of spiritual power that only has relevance where the gospel of Jesus has first been proclaimed. I pointed out that the word anti has two meanings. First of all, against. Secondly, in place of. And the pressure of the spirit of Antichrist is against Jesus, the true Messiah, to eliminate him but then the second move is to replace him by a false messiah. And I suggested to you that spiritual force is very actively at work in the church today. I also tried to give you just a little picture of what I believe the final manifestation of the spirit of Antichrist, the Antichrist, the beast, will be like. <clears throat> now I want to move on from the negative 
to the positive. In this final talk, I want to deal with the church's victory. I've tried to briefly define the main enemies we face with the purpose of showing how we can obey God and overcome those enemies by the means that he has provided. The first thing I think we need to understand is this, that all the promises that close the Bible, all the promises in the book of Revelation, the final revelation of Jesus to his church, all the positive promises are only for those who overcome. There are no promises for the defeated. Paul said, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. I believe we have only two options in the last resort. We either overcome or we are overcome. There is no third ground. And there are no positive promises of God whatever for those who allow themselves to be overcome. In the chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, we have a word that Jesus sent to each of seven churches. And every final promise to each of those seven churches is to the one who overcomes. There are no promises to the one who do not overcome. I think we need to face this very seriously. God has made it possible for us to overcome. He expects us to overcome. And then that is really summed up in one verse near the end of Revelation. In chapter 21 and verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So the overcomer gets everything, and the one who does not overcome gets nothing. It is either it's total one way or the other. I think one of the great deceptions that the devil foists upon the Christian church is to somehow convince us there's some middle ground. Well, I'm not really an overcomer, but I don't want to accept the fact that I'm overcome. I don't think the New Testament indicates there is any such middle ground. So we're talking now about overcomers. Every now and then some new group emerges within the church who claim to be the overcomers. In the course of my Christian experience, which has lasted nearly 50 years, I could name two or three different groups. I want to tell you this, if you ever encounter a group who tell you that if you want to be right, you've got to join us, you can be sure of one thing, if you join them, you're wrong. <laughs> no one has a monopoly of overcoming, all right? It's, it's not a label, it's not a doctrine, it's a life. All right, now we're, we're speaking to overcomers to those who are convinced by faith in Scripture and in Jesus that it's possible to overcome. The first thing we need to understand in dealing with these satanic forces is very important and very basic. It is that Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has already administered to Satan a total, permanent, final irreversible defeat. Okay? If you don't understand that, you don't have any basis for victory. Let me say those words again. A total, permanent, final, irrevocable defeat. There's nothing that Satan can do that can ever change that fact. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. And it's finished. Nothing needs ever to be added to what he did, and nothing can ever be taken away from what he did. Uh, this is stated in one, very place, one place very clearly is in Colossians, chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. <clears throat> now these are complicated uh, statements, and I could spend the rest of this session trying to explain what they mean, but I don't intend to do that. I just want to pinpoint certain statements. Colossians 2, beginning at verse 13. 
And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he, that is God the Father, has made alive together with him, Jesus Christ the Son, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Let's, let's start with the closing verse. The, the principalities and powers referred to there are the same as we saw earlier in Ephesians 6.12. Our wrestling match is against principalities and powers, the various levels and orders of Satan's kingdom. That is what we are fighting against. But we need to understand that Jesus has already ministered a total public defeat. The word used there is he has triumphed. You need to understand what a triumph is. It's part of the, um, the culture of the Roman Empire. When a Roman general was particularly successful in war, when he returned to Rome, the Senate of Rome voted him a triumph. And in this triumph, he was placed in a chariot drawn by a white horse. And he was led through the streets of Rome. And all the people of Rome lined the streets applauding him. And behind him were all the evidences of his victories. The rulers, the commanders that he had defeated were led in chains behind him. Then great numbers of prisoners were led behind him. And in some cases, even wild animals from the te conquered territories. Animals maybe the Roman people had not seen. So this is a triumph. It's not winning the victory. It's the celebration of the victory that has already been won. And Paul, in this language, is saying that by his death and resurrection, Jesus was placed in the triumphal chariot and led through the unseen world. And behind him were all the forces of Satan led in chains. That's the totality of the victory. Now, to obtain this victory, Jesus did two things for us. And I'm a, I can only touch on them briefly. The first relates to the past. We need to bear in mind that Satan's great weapon against us is guilt. As long as he can keep us guilty, we are no match for him. But in this victory, Jesus dealt with the problem of guilt. First, in regard to the past, he made it possible for us to be forgiven all our previous sins says, having forgiven you all trespasses. That little word, all, is very important. We have to believe that every sin we've ever committed has been forgiven. If we have even one unforgiven sin, it's a lever that Satan can use against us to frustrate us and make us ineffective. The other thing is more complicated, but let me just say it briefly. Jesus has abolished the law of Moses as the means to achieve righteousness with God. Not abolished it as part of the word of God or part of the history of Israel. It's not abolished all the lessons that come to us from the law of Moses, but he has abolished the law of Moses as the requirement for achieving righteousness with God. As long as the law was the requirement, every time we wanted to claim righteousness, Satan could stand there and point to some commandment, some ordinance, that we had not obeyed and said, there you are, they have no right of approach. But when Jesus died on the cross, he put an end to the law in that aspect. And the scripture says very, very vividly, he nailed it to the cross. So when we go beyond the cross, we're not under the law. Now our righteousness does not depend on keeping commandments. It depends on faith. We are justified, made righteous by faith. This is always so vivid to me in regard to the dealings of Jesus with Peter. At the Last Supper, Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the night is out. Of course, Peter said he wouldn't, but you know he did. 
Then Jesus said, but I have prayed for you, not that you will not deny me, but what? That your faith will not fail. If you can keep believing, your faith will take you through. So never get moved away from your faith. Let no failure, let no accusation, nothing ever move you from your faith that Jesus died in your place, bore your sins, was made sin for you, and has offered you the garment of his spotless righteousness. You know what to be justified means? This is not part of my message, but it's so important. It's a, it's a legal phrase. You've been tried by the court of heaven, and the court has handed down its verdict. And the verdict is not guilty. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> not guilty. Satan, you can say what you like. You can point out all my sins and all my failings and all my inadequacies, and I'll agree with you. <laughs> I'll probably tell you some you don't know about. <laughs> but the court of heaven has said, not guilty. I am reckoned righteous, made righteous, justified. You know what I say? Just as if I'd never sinned. That's it. And when you stand on that ground, you are more than a conqueror of Satan in the conquest that Jesus has already won. If we start from any other basis, we'll never achieve victory. The only basis is the cross. And then, having deprived Satan of his weapons against us, and the one great sovereign supreme weapon is guilt, Jesus has equipped us with the weapons with which to defeat Satan. That's the second part of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, <coughs> verses 3, 4, and 5. Ruth and I make this confession. I think we'll do it together. This is, we have a number of scriptures, I mean probably 50, that we proclaim as part of our spiritual warfare. And this happens to be one. So you talk close to the microphone. For though we walk in the flesh, we war not after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing which exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the, the obedience of Christ. Christ. What a victory that is, isn't it? Amen. Thank you so much. You see, we have weapons that are not carnal. So what are they? If they're not carnal, what are they? Spiritual. Spiritual. In other words, we don't use bombs or tanks or rifles because we're not fighting persons with bodies. They're useless. But we have been given in place of those physical material weapons, spiritual weapons that we can use, and this is what we are to use them for. Pulling down strongholds. Whose strongholds? Yeah. Satan's, that's right. If you notice the next verse, there are various alternative translations. You can have arguments, reasoning, speculations. And then it speaks about the mind and the thought. So we discover the battlefield. Very important to know what the battlefield is. It's the mind. How many of you realize that? Most of your problems as a Christian are in the area of the mind. Don't let that discourage you. That's where the war is. But we've been given the weapons of victory. And we can pull down Satan's strongholds or roadblocks or fortresses. You see, Satan builds up fortresses in the minds of men and women to prevent them being able to receive the truth of the gospel. And one of our functions is by the spiritual weapons God has given us, prayer, preaching, praise, and so on, to break down those strongholds and open the way for the Word of God to enter and to save people and to change them. We dealt, for instance, with two anti-Christian forces, Judaism and Islam, in our last talk. Each of them has a specific stronghold that you have to break down. The stronghold in the Jewish mind is, if I believe in Jesus, I'll no longer be Jewish. You may not be aware of that, but that is the strongest 
barrier that they have against receiving the truth about Jesus. The Muslim stronghold is God doesn't need a son. There isn't a son of God. And if you're going to reach either Jews or Muslims effectively, you're going to have to use these spiritual weapons to break down those strongholds before you can really make an impact on them. So we have the weapons for victory. Notice the ultimate aim is to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It's a staggering assignment. First of all, we have to release people's minds from the false captivity of Satan. And then we have to bring their minds into captivity to obedience to Jesus. That's wonderful, isn't it? But we've been given the weapons to do it. Now, my talk tonight is not on those weapons. I've given many talks on that theme in the past. But I want to deal just with certain general basic requirements if the church is to be victorious. I'm going to deal with them briefly. I have actually listed seven. You could probably make it eight or you could make it six. But in my making of outlines, when I get to the number seven, I usually stop. All right, let's turn to Matthew 12, 25. Here's a statement by Jesus, which is extremely important. And I think I'm afraid the church has often ignored it. Matthew 12, 25. Jesus said, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. We've spoken about the kingdom of God. But if the kingdom of God is divided against itself, it cannot win. So Satan's primary attack on the church is to divide us. Has he been successful? I'm sorry to say he's been extremely successful. And one thing we have to do is resist division. That does not mean that we automatically associate ourselves with everyone or everything that's called Christian. But it means that wherever there are people who are true believers in Jesus, according to the scripture, and committed to love him and serve him, we have to acknowledge them as our brothers and sisters. And we do not let unnecessary barriers come between them and us. Ruth and I, in our ministry, we work with I don't know how many different ministries and persons around the world. And basically, I could say we don't have any problems in our relationships with them. I think the primary reason is because they and we are committed to something positive. And we're committed to Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Then the end will come. We believe this is our responsibility to prepare the way for the Lord by proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. And wherever we meet with people who have that primary aim based on scripture, we may never have met them before, but in 10 minutes we feel like we've known them all our lives. So let's not focus on the negative. Let's focus on the positive. You find where people are truly committed to prayer and intercession or do evangelism, the barriers melt. But where people are all tied up with church structured and programs, there usually are problems. So the first thing we have to do is guard against division. It's not easy. We certainly don't have all the answers. But when we give it due priority, I think we'll be nearer to achieving it. Then the second thing we have to do, and this is tremendously important, is to know and proclaim the whole of God's word. And I want to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. This has become a very significant chapter for me recently because I think it's a picture of the last days. Uh, if you begin at the first verse of 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. And the whole of this third chapter deals with things that are particularly relevant to the last days. 
the first thing it does is to paint a picture of the general degeneration of human character and conduct as the age comes to its close. And Paul picks out 18 major moral or ethical blemishes which will characterize humanity at the close of this age. And really the root of them all is selfishness. Love of self, love of money, and love of pleasure. I don't know three words that better describe our contemporary civilization than that. Love of self, love of money, and love of pleasure. All the others are within that context. The great enemy is selfishness. We need to bear that in mind because the fact that we don't indulge in drugs or alcohol or immorality does not necessarily separate us from the world. The only thing that really separates us is unselfishness. And I think a lot of moral, good living churchgoers are basically extremely selfish people. It's number one first. And we need to understand that isn't the distinctive mark of the church in these, in these days. The distinctive mark is unselfishness. A commitment to God and to humanity to serve and be servants. Then Paul goes on from there and he points out various other features of the close of the age, some we will return to perhaps later, he very clearly depicts a tremendous upsurge of the occult, which again is very conspicuous in our time. And then he comes to what I believe is God's answer at the end of chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. How much of Scripture? Oh, are you sure? <laughs> so a lot of people are not sure about that any longer. There's a lot of preachers that believe it's their job to straighten God out and edit the Bible and point out where it needs to be changed. That is not my attitude, I want to say. I believe all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I understand that to mean that for God's people to be thoroughly equipped, the whole truth of the Bible has to be presented to them, not just little passages. You have to know what is in the book of Ezra. You have to know the teaching of Amos. You have to understand the epistle to, the, to Philemon, see because they're all necessary for you to be thoroughly equipped. You may have to take much less time in front of the television if you're going to be thoroughly equipped, because it's a pretty full-time job being thoroughly equipped for Christian service. Now, bear in mind the chapter divisions were not there by Paul, from Paul. So Paul goes on in the next chapter, the first verse, I charge you therefore. What's the therefore for? You've heard me say this. When you find a therefore, you want to find out what it's there for. That's right. Because of what he said at the end of chapter 3, then he comes to this tremendously solemn charge. Look at the words. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. You couldn't have a more solemn charge than that. In the, as it were, in the presence of God and in the light of the fact that we'll all have to answer to Jesus at his judgment seat when he comes. So what's the message? Verse 2, preach the word. Let's say that together, shall we? Preach the word. I put the in with thing. Let's do it, do it my way this time. Preach the word. All right. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. Let me ask you a frank question. You don't have to answer. How many of you go to church on Sunday morning expecting to be convinced, rebuked, and exhorted? Some of you wouldn't go back to that church again if they treated you like that. <laughs> but if the minister's doing his job, that's what will happen to you. Now, how true this is of the time in which we live. For the time will come, I believe the time has come, 
when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. I think this is conspicuous in the Western Church. There are many, many Christians who have to have a new doctrine, a new revelation, something new to tickle them and excite them. But that's not our job. Our job is to preach the word. And so Paul concludes this section. But you, that's Timothy, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. I don't believe there's ever been a time when it's more important to hold fast to the absolute truth and authority of Scripture. It's being attacked and undermined in many quarters which we wouldn't anticipate. Movements and churches and groups that we would consider to be sound in the faith have moved from that foundation in these last few decades. Let me quote the words of Paul to you in Acts 20, 27. I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I'm impressed by those words, I have not shunned, because it would indicate that there's a lot of pressures that would cause you not to declare the whole counsel of God. Is that true? Yes. Social pressures, financial pressures, denominational pressures. If you want to be popular, it might be easily be the quickest way not to declare the whole counsel of God. But remember that we are answerable ultimately to God. Paul said, I'm pure from the blood of all men. I think he was thinking in terms of God's word to Ezekiel, I've made you a watchman to your people. If trouble is coming and you warn them and they don't listen, they'll perish. But you've saved your soul. But if trouble is coming and you don't warn them and they perish, their blood will be upon your hands. And I think Paul said, for that reason, I'm pure from the blood of all men. No one's blood can be laid at my door because I have not shunned to declare to you all the counsel of God. The third requirement, I think, is very important. It's stated in 1 Peter chapter 5. Verses 5 and 6. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Now, being over 70, of course, I can say a hearty amen to that. <laughs> but it isn't, doesn't end there, see. Yes, all of you, over 70, or over 50, or under 20, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. See, there's been a lot of talk in the church recently about submission. And I believe submission has a scriptural basis. I point out to most people what really matters is not submission, but submissiveness. <coughs> you can be submissive even when you don't submit. It's the attitude rather than the code of conduct. Peter says, all of you be clothed with humility. That's a metaphor that doesn't come out in the English. The word he uses means put on an apron of humility. And the word is used for an apron that was worn only by slaves. So when you had this apron on, everybody knew you were a slave. So he says, put on an apron, an attitude of humility, which shows you're the slave of everybody. Because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. I always point out to people, humility is not something God can do for us. God never says, I will make you humble. God always says, make yourself humble. It's a decision. We have to make it. And then, I won't turn there, but if you're interested, there's a remarkable example in Ezra chapter 8, verses 21 through 23 of one specific way of humbling ourselves. Ezra and the party of exiles returning from Babylon to Jerusalem were confronted with a very dangerous journey that took them, I think, four months. 
They had with them all the precious vessels of the temple and their wives and their children. But Ezra refused a military escort from the Persian monarch and said, we're going to trust God. He had to do that because he testified that God protected those who served him. See, that's one of the blessings of testifying. When you testify, you have to live up to your testimony. <laughs> so he didn't ask for a band of soldiers and horsemen, but he said, we proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahaba, that we might afflict or humble ourselves before God and seek of him a right way. And this is a totally scriptural. I don't have to go, don't have time to go into it. But one of the appointed ways of humbling ourselves is by fasting. David said in Psalm 35, 30, 13, I humbled my soul with fasting. Why does your soul need to be humbled? Because it's the arrogant, self-seeking ego in you. It's the thing that says, I want, I think, I feel, I'm important, look at me. And that has to be humbled before God can really have his way in our lives. Whenever I tell this, I always think of a lawyer in Washington, D.C., some year, good many years ago now. Heard me teach on fasting. He was a Christian. Decided he would do it. Had a miserable day. Every time he walked past a restaurant or a delicatessen, he, his mouth watered and his stomach cramped and he wanted to go in. But he finished the day without, fast, without breaking his fast. Then in the evening, he gave his stomach a lecture. And he said, now stomach, you've been very troublesome today. You've made a lot of trouble for me. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to fast tomorrow as well. <laughs> That's how we have to deal with the, the self-assertive part of us. We have to bring it into subjection to the will and mind of God. I do believe that those Christians who do not in some scriptural way learn to practice fasting, will not be able to administer the total victory of God. After all, Jesus couldn't do it. He started his ministry by 40 days of fasting. Do you think that we're further along than Jesus? He didn't say to his disciples, if you fast. He said, when you fast. He used exactly the same language about fasting in the sermon in, in chapter 6 of Matthew as he did about prayer. If he expects us to pray, he expects us to fast. Now you have to sort that out for yourselves and also you have to find out from the Holy Spirit what way and how to do it. But I would say for Ruth and myself, I, I think we could say we wouldn't dare to go ahead in the ministry that we're in if we didn't practice regular fasting. Because we are challenging, basically, all the major forces of Satan in the world today. We are challenging them head on. And we need every help that we can get from God. And one way is by fasting. I've got a little book somewhere that's entitled, How to Fast Successfully. I have a week's radio teaching on fasting. I don't want to take time now, but if you're interested, you can obtain them. Going on. The next thing we must do is put on the whole armor of God. We need to turn to Ephesians 6 for a moment. Immediately after the 12th verse, which speaks about the kingdom of Satan in the heavenlies, <coughs> Paul says, in my version, that the next word is therefore. All right, verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. And notice you have to take it up. It doesn't grow on you. God doesn't fit it on you. You have to take it up. Now, Paul was writing to people who were Christians, just as much Christians as you and I. But he placed on them the responsibility to take up the armor. And if you look through the armor, we'll go through it very quickly. <coughs> In verse 14, the girdle of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, the shoes of the preparation of the gospel. Verse 16, the shield of faith. Verse 17, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. If you analyze that, you are completely protected from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, except for one area, which is the back. That's right. If you turn your back, there's no protection. 
It's important to remember. But that's not the full list. There are six items there, and in the Bible, usually when a thing is complete and it's good, it's seven. And the next one is perhaps as important as any of them. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. I think it's Charles Wesley who talks about the weapon of all prayer. And really, all prayer is the weapon by which we can reach out into the heavenlies and attack Satan's kingdom at its base. The others are mainly weapons of self-protection. But all prayer is, if you like, it's our intercontinental ballistic missile. It can reach any target anywhere if we set the computer right. <coughs> the next thing we have to do is realize our need of God's supernatural power. And I want to say supernatural. Christianity is a religion of the supernatural. I once read through the book of Acts, examining it to see what would happen if I removed all reference to the manifestly supernatural. That's not just inward supernatural experiences, but things that are visible, that can be perceived by the senses. The book of Acts has 28 chapters. And at the end of that, I discovered not one chapter out of the 28 would be left intact if we eliminated the supernatural. And that's the only record we have in Scripture of how the church is intended to operate. We cannot operate effectively and accomplish the will of God solely by our own natural ability. We have to have the supernatural enabling of the Holy Spirit. And one main form of that enabling is the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We won't turn there, but let's look at just one statement of Paul which I think is important. It really summarizes what I'm saying. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 20. First Corinthians 4 and verse 20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. It's not a matter of theology. And theology has its place. It's not a matter of argument. It's not a matter of intellectual proof. It's the demonstration of the supernatural power of God. I'd like to look at the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, just one, two chapters back. The first five verses. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. <coughs> For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him you remember what we said about Galatians chapter 3? What does witchcraft obscure in the church? Jesus Christ crucified. Paul said, that's all I'm going to be interested in. Jesus Christ crucified. I, I was preaching just recently to a congregation which contained a large number of Jews in Jerusalem. And I pointed out to them that really the thing which is supremely esteemed amongst the Jewish people generally is knowledge. And here's a Jew who says, I determine not to know anything. <laughs> That's very unusual. Except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Paul says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and much trembling. He wasn't an impressive speaker by any means. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit and of power. That was Paul's secret. Why did the Holy Spirit testify to his ministry with power? Because he focused on Jesus Christ crucified. You can bring all sorts of elegant sermons and theories and quote all sorts of doctors and people. The Holy Spirit is just bored. But when you begin to lift up Jesus crucified, he says, I'll bear testimony to that. And I believe that is the primary need of the church today, especially here, when we're, 
in this country today, we are surrounded by Muslims. Do you realize that? Millions of Muslims. And there's nothing going to reach the Muslim mind but the demonstration of the supernatural. And we have an opportunity. Instead of having to go to them, they've come to us. We couldn't go to their nations and proclaim the gospel because we'd be put in prison or executed. But God has arranged for them to come here. What's the church doing about it? It's time the church rose up, said we will demonstrate to them that Jesus is alive. As I say sometimes, there's no extra charge for that. It isn't in my outline, but it happens to be true. <laughs> Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 again for a moment. I just want to point out something there. Remember, this is all about the last days. That's the whole theme of this chapter. And he says in verse 8, 2 Timothy 3 verse 8, Now as Jannes and Jamres resisted Moses. Jannes and Jamres were the magicians of Egypt. They resisted Moses. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith. But they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as was the folly of Jannes and Jamres. So what Paul is saying is, the contest that took place between Moses and the magicians of Egypt in the court of Pharaoh is going to be reenacted in these days between the servants of Jesus Christ and the practitioners of the occult. And it's not going to be settled by theology. It's a contest of power. Whose power is greater? And bear in mind the magicians of Egypt had a lot of power. The first three miracles that Moses did, they could repeat. They could turn their rods into snakes. They could turn water into blood. They could call up frogs out of the river. All of that was supernatural. But when they got beyond that and Moses went further, they said, this is the finger of God. Now we're out of our depth. I don't know if you've ever thought about Moses. I particularly like this, Moses and Aaron. They went there with the rod and Pharaoh said, show me what you can do, you guys. And so I think it was Aaron threw down the rod and it became a snake. Well, amazingly enough, Pharaoh wasn't much impressed. So he said to his magicians, can you do that? And they said, we can. They threw down their rods, they became snakes. But there was one thing that further that happened. Moses' snake ate up the snakes of the Egyptians. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever thought about the scene that followed. The magicians woke out without any rods and Moses' rod was much thicker and stronger than the <laughs> That's how it's going to be, you understand? It's going to be whose rod wins. I, if people disagree with me, I sometimes say, well, listen, don't let's argue. Let's throw down our rods and see which, which snake wins. <laughs> really, that's where it's at. It's not argument. It's demonstration. That's what's needed. And particularly in the gifts of the Spirit, we need the three revelatory gifts. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, discerning of spirit. The word of knowledge shows us Satan's operations, how he's working in the supernatural realm. The word of wisdom shows us how to counter his actions and defeat him. And discerning of spirit shows us when we're face to face with demonic power and activity. We desperately need those in the church today. Must move on. The next, the sixth point in my outline is we must apply the power of jubilant praise and bold proclamation. And there's one scripture which has become a favorite with me in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 7. Jeremiah 31, 7. This is concerning the restoration of Israel in these last days. For thus says the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. There are three weapons or three activities spoken of there which I believe are crucial for us to understand. They are praise, proclaim, and pray. Praying is this saying, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. 
Now the Lord has declared he's going to save the remnant of Israel. You could say, well, he could do it without our praying. But God says in another place, I will not do it until I'm inquired for to do it. Understand? Praying is our contribution to the outworking of God's purposes in the earth. And God, somebody said, has chosen to need us. He could have done without us, but he's not going to. But praying is not just thinking of anything we want and asking for it. Praying is dis discovering God's revealed purpose in Scripture and then praying for the outworking of that purpose. Summed up really beautifully in the words of the Virgin Mary when the angel brought the promise. She said, be it unto me according to thy word. That's the most powerful prayer you can ever pray. Paul said, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. How? By fulfilling his word. Because what God has promised in his word is far above anything that we in our natural mind could ask or think. So prayer. But as I say, it's not going to God with a shopping list. It's intelligently discovering God's purpose and then aligning ourselves with it. And it takes persistence. There are some things that Ruth and I have been praying for for 10 years. They haven't come yet. When that happens, you know, you discover whether you're praying in faith or unbelief. Because if you're praying in unbelief, you say, well, I've been praying for 10 years and nothing has happened. But if you're praying in faith, you say the answer is 10 years nearer than when I started praying. See? <laughs> Jesus said men ought to persist in prayer and not to faint. I think Ruth and I have discovered that this is one of the great tests and shaping instruments of Christian character is persistence in prayer. Discovering the will of God and asking God to do what he said he will do. Then there is praise. Uh, in Psalm 102, uh, well, we might as well turn there. Keep your finger in Jeremiah 31 because we're coming back, hopefully, time permits. Psalm 102, this is again a prophecy of the restoration of Zion at the close of this day. <coughs> and it says in verse 18, Psalm 102, after the prophecy of the restoration of Zion, says, this will be written for the generation to come, that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. I believe that refers to this time of the restoration of Zion. God is creating a people with one supreme commitment to do what? To praise him. That's right. It's as though God says, well, my people have been so slack through so many centuries to give me the kind of praise that I desire, that I'm going to create a people especially to praise me. And I think the charismatic movement is the beginning of that. I think there's many weaknesses and failings in the charismatic movement, but there has come forth a new level of praise, at least a vision of what praise could be and how important it is to praise God. In Psalm 8, David said, Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength that thou mightest, because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still or silence the enemy and the avenger. And when Jesus quoted that in Matthew 21, verse 9, he changed the words, Thou hast ordained strength, to thou hast perfected praise. So what is the ordained strength of God's people? Perfected praise. What does that do? It silences who? The enemy and the avenger. Why do we need to silence Satan? What is he doing all this time? Accusing us. You say, why doesn't God stop Satan from accusing us? Because God says, I've given you the means to stop Satan. If you learn to praise me the way I want to be praised, it'll silence Satan. I was preaching in Lausanne with, an, with a French interpreter some years back. And I quoted this and I... It was quoted in French, and I understand French. 
and I was gripped by the phrase. It says, praise imposes silence on the enemy and the avenger. What a wonderful revelation that we can impose silence on Satan. We can say to him, shut up. Isn't that marvelous? What do we do that? How do we do that? By praise. See, if God's people would take the time and learn to praise him and spend hours in praising him with pure hearts and honest motives, not trying to twist God's arm, but praising him because he's worthy of praise, the whole atmosphere around would change. People's hearts would be open. The dark powers that are bound men and women will be shaken and driven out. I tell you, we've only just done the fringe of a mighty ocean, which is the power of praise. And then, going back to Jeremiah 37, proclamation. This is something that God has begun to quicken for Ruth and me in the last few years in a new measure. You see, proclaiming is actually the activity of a herald. And uh, in uh, the New Testament, the word that's used for a preacher is the word for a herald. Paul said that God had made him a teacher, an apostle, and a herald, a proclaimer. And uh, since I started my radio program, I've got a more and ever-increasing vision of what can be achieved just by proclaiming the truth of the Word of God. See, one of the great strengths of Islam, as we've been speaking about Islam, is that for more than 13 centuries, five times every day, out of that mosque has gone the proclamation about Allah and Muhammad. And that has created a darkness over those nations which you haven't experienced it, you have no idea of its intensity. What's that? That's the power of false proclamation. We need to overcome that power with the power of true proclamation. We need to proclaim the truth. As, I, as you saw, Ruth and I have got an armory of scriptures that we use to proclaim. And we proclaim them, many of them, several times a week. Let's do Deuteronomy 33:25, just to give you a little demonstration. Now, when we proclaim them, we turn you in the Bible into us, you see? Now, this is Deuteronomy 33, 25 and following. The, the bolts, bolts of our gates will be iron and bronze, and our strength will equal our days. There is no one like the God of Jeshurun, who rides on the heavens to help us, and on the clouds in his majesty. The eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will drive out our enemy before us, saying, destroy him. <laughs> Wait a minute. We'll do one more. This is, very, this is just one verse. This is 2 Corinthians 9, 8. It's the basis of our faith for the financial supply of our ministry. And again, we change you into us. God is, is able, able to, to make, make all grace abound toward us, that we always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. When you say that every day, how can you possibly fear any lack? And notice it's grace. I just want to tell you that. You don't have to earn it. You have to believe it. All right. We come to the last uh, point in requirements for the church to be victorious. Revelation 12, 11. Many of you know this scripture. They, the believers on earth, overcame him. Who's him? Satan. Satan. You realize that we're in a direct conflict with Satan? Very clear. They overcame him. Nothing in between. It's person to person conflict. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. That's really another example of proclamation. I teach this means that we overcome Satan when we testify personally to what the word of God says the blood of Jesus does for us. We proclaim it. 
I have a sevenfold proclamation, but we don't have time for it. But when you do that, you overcome Satan. But you've got to be a certain kind of person. It says of these people, they did not love their lives to the death. What does that mean? It means this, that it was more important for them to do the will of God than to stay alive. What's that? That's commitment. Satan is not afraid of uncommitted Christians. In the last resort, he can wear them down. But those who are prepared to lay down their lives rather than deny the Lord or withdraw their testimony, they are the overcomer. Amen. Let's pray, shall we, as we close. Let's pray for the church, ourselves included. Oh God, we thank you that your word has made so clear to us the conditions for victory and of all the glorious possibility of victory. And we want to confess, Lord, our sins and our shortcomings that many times we have not believed you, we have not obeyed you. Lord, we're sorry and we ask your forgiveness on behalf of ourselves and the whole church of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will enable us to meet the conditions to be overcomers for your glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. If you would like information about further teaching resources available from Derek Prince Ministries UK, please call us and request a copy of our latest resource guide on 01462 492 100. You may also visit our website at www.dpmuk.org or write to us at DPMUK, Kingsfield, Hadrian Way, Baldock, SG7 6AN.